Mr. Chair, we are live, ready to go on your call. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, welcome to the Budget Committee meeting for March 31st, 2021, where we will be talking about the uh, Parks and Rec budget. As is usual with the beginning of these meetings, I'd like to run through the uh, list of councillors just to make sure that we have their audio and video uh, working, uh, working well. Um, so let's start with District 1 and Councillor Daigle Gammon. Good morning, Mr. Chair, fellow colleagues. Here I am uh, in my tree house with the uh, tree from Myers Grant again for Parks and Rec and ready to roll. District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadabit Valley and all the beautiful communities in between. There you go. Good morning. And uh, Councillor Hensby, District 2. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Hensby here, District 2, Preston, Chesapeake, Eastern Shore. And uh, I hope uh, Councillor Lovelace enjoy yourself on the beautiful Eastern Shore yesterday. Great time to have a tour with her. Oh, good stuff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kent, District 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Kent here from District 3, Dartmouth South Eastern Passage, and all that it has um, to offer here in our area. And Ms. Councillor Hensby, I'm looking forward to my scheduled appointment. I don't think we have one yet. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Good stuff. Getting around to see everybody is important. Uh, Councillor Purdy, District 4. Good morning, Mr. Chair, everyone. Uh, great to see the sun and the warm temperatures expected today. And uh, yeah, Councillor Hensby, we did a tour of my district, so now it's time to do yours. I'll be awaiting that phone call. Thank you, uh, Councillor Austin, District 5. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm here and ready to go. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mancini, District 6. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, Councillor Lovelace, after spending the day with Councillor Hensby and Touring, she'll never be the same again, but uh, good luck to you, Councillor. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Councillor Mason, District 7. I don't see you here. Okay. Uh, I do believe Council he is at the legislature. He might be, yep. Um, Councillor Smith, District 8. Hello, Chair, colleagues, we're ready to go. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary, District 9. Hello, colleagues uh, from Halifax West Armdale, ready to get going on this National Tater Day. Good stuff, thank you. Councillor Morse, District 10. Good morning, colleagues, ready to go. Looking forward to hearing from Parks and Recreation. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuddle, District 11. Good morning, everyone. Beautiful day out there and uh, looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stoddard, District 12. Good morning, everyone. Those looking onward from um, our YouTube. Good morning, colleagues. Mr. Mayor, coming to you from sunny District 12, Timberley, Beachville, Clayton Park West, Lakeside, and Wedgwood. I'm sitting here among the crocuses that have pushed through People's Gardens. That's awesome. It's, it's great to see spring happening. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, District 13. Good morning, colleagues. Coming to you from Hannah's Plain, St. Margaret's, where I am just delighted with such an incredible tour. Thank you, David, for, for showing me around the hood and answering all of my questions. Um, I encourage all of you to uh, take a stroll out to Ecom Secum. And, uh, you know, from Hubbers to Ecom Secum, uh, we are a gorgeous municipality. And Tony, you're next. So I'll be in District 6 uh, very soon touring. Thank you. Good stuff. Mr. Chair, uh, I do have Pam Pamela Lovelace's uh, travel visa. She's allowed two hours in District 6 and then she has to leave. Good stuff. I, I, I hope you don't charge her the same rate that you charge me. No, it'll be cheaper. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, Councillor Blackburn, District 14. Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, early uh, happy Easter and happy Passover. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mayor Othit, uh, District 16. Good morning from sunny Bedford Wentworth. And I'm wondering, uh, did he happen to mention uh, Sandy Point Road on that tour at all, Pam? Of but, uh, course he did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, looking forward to today, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And from districts one to 16, Mayor Mike Savage. Uh, good morning, Chair and uh, colleagues. Today, uh, 
As some of you might know, it was the International Day of Visibility where we recognize discrimination faced by our transgender uh, community. And I know that we all uh, would honor that. And I also have to say, uh, if you see me on the screen smiling uh, uncontrollably for no particular reason, that's because today is the day that my mom died 18 years ago and uh, she's with us still and uh, love her. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move ahead with the agenda. Uh, we have the approval of the minutes and there are no minutes to approve this morning. Uh, so call for declaration of conflict of interest. And hearing none, uh, next we have the public participation section of the meeting. As a reminder to those watching from home, in order to have signed up uh, as a speaker, the deadline was 4.30 p.m. the business day prior to the hearing. We have five speakers registered for today's meeting. Any member of the public who has registered with the clerk's office uh, on this matter will be given uh, five minutes to address the topic. When I call your name, you may unmute your mic and begin speaking. And I'm gonna hand it over to the clerk. Good morning, everyone. Uh, members of the public, if you're using your telephone instead of Zoom to, to participate, please ensure your webcast or TV broadcasts are muted and that you're listening using your phone. When you hear your name announced, please press star six. If you hear an announcement, you will hear an announcement you're no longer muted and wait for the chair to tell you that it is your turn to speak. Reminder that is for people using the phone, not Zoom. Once you have finished your comments and answering any questions of clarification, please hang up your telephone and watch the meeting using the webcast. Uh, for those of you using Zoom, you can use your computer or use the screen, uh, the controls on the bottom left-hand side to mute and unmute yourself and to turn on your camera. Mr. Chair, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, the first three speakers this morning are Karen McKendry, Ross Jefferson, and Kelly Allen. Uh, Karen, are you with us this morning? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Karen, we can hear you. You have five minutes, uh, go ahead. Well, thanks very much for hearing from me this morning. Um, so today I'd like to speak to the Parks and Rec uh, budget, it's specifically uh, a certain part of it. So I've also been following the strategic priorities development and uh, am now looking at how those priorities are resourced in the budget, because I feel like this is where the proof in the pudding is, where you act on your priorities by resourcing them. So first I'll speak to connecting the strategic priorities uh, planning framework to park acquisition, and then I'll speak more specifically to the budget. And my focus today is on parkland acquisition geared towards expanding the large uh, regional parks like Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes and Sandy Lake. So from the recent um, strategic planning framework, we know that council priority areas are prosperous economy, integrated mobility, communities, and environment. And then the environment priority is further defined as leadership in climate change action, which we all know, and environmental protection. That part is then further defined as healthy and protected ecosystems, support, biodiversity, and connected habitats, and enhanced quality of life. And a major way to do this is through expanding and managing the large regional parks. They do just what this says, protect ecosystems, support biodiversity, connect habitats, and enhance quality of life. However, then parks are only talked about in the strategic planning framework under the community's priority area. And I'm sure that parks do uh, contribute to communities, uh, but they also, especially in the case of the large regional parks like Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes, uh, contribute to the environment priority area as well. Also, a later strategic planning document goes on to propose key performance indicators under these priority areas. And there are KPIs for parks, but again, they're under communities. What we don't have is KPIs under environment uh, for things like parkland acquisition that accomplishes some of our region's environmental goals. So how do we know if parkland acquisition is being accomplished adequately in order to contribute to environment? And I feel like we should. I mean, the definition of regional parks in the regional plan is the primary objective of regional park is to preserve and protect significant natural or cultural resources. And then it goes on to define a lot of the environmental aspects that a regional park could include. Also under Halifax, there are calls to action. It includes, and I quote, for land protection, strategies include, it lists a number of strategies. One of them is expanding natural areas. And also in Halifax, we find a call that, quote, the municipality will continue to strategically acquire lands that provide ecological value and preserve biodiversity. 
So, but again, the strategic priorities framework and the budget don't make that connection between acquisition of parkland at regional parks and helping to achieve uh, the goals of regional park definition and health act. So my questions today are, how can we see if parkland acquisition is contributing to these calls to action if where there isn't a connection in the park's budget that links it to Halifax and ideally to KPIs as well? Uh, also, how can the Parks and Rec budget document make these connections between the acquisition budget from year to year to show that we're responding to these calls to action? So specifically in the details of the Park and Rec budget that's presented today, the details do show that key deliverables include acquiring and developing parkland following uh, Council's directions at specific sites, and that work is needed to progress certain plans such as Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes Regional Park. Acquisition at Blue Mountain and potentially other sites are priority uh, this year. Uh, in last year's priority areas for acquisition were listed by name, including Sandy Lake and other parks, but this year only Blue Mountain is listed and the others are alluded to. So I'd love to hear from staff what other areas other than Blue Mountain are a priority for parkland acquisition this year. I'm also encouraged to see that community engagement is listed as another key deliverable, but not specifically for the regional parks I just mentioned, Blue Mountain and Sandy Lake. Uh, for these areas, there are very competent community groups, as many of you know, who are waiting to engage more on the future of these areas, including through planning. So is this a key deliverable for Parks and Rec this year? And if so, where does that appear in the budget? And are there staff resources in place to support this additional engagement? So we need parkland acquisition and we need community engagement at Blue Mountain and Sandy Lake. And if staff are challenged to accommodate this increased engagement because of staff resources, are more resources being requested at this time through the budget. Finally, I'll speak to the specific amount for the parkland acquisition budget this year. I've actually looked at this amount over the last 20 years of budgets and it varies uh, substantially. And I think that's because it carries over from year to year. Some years there's no request for new funds, um, but funds carry over. Once there was a very large amount in anticipation of Shaw Wilderness Park purchased by HRM, so again, my Karen, question I'm, is- Karen, I'm yep. going to interrupt and, and remind yep. you that you're just about at five minutes. So- Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, just like two more sentences because <laughs> this kind of brings it home. So my question is how do we determine the amount of the parkland acquisition budget and does it take into account opportunities? And then how do we know that we are advancing these priorities from year to year? So for example, I don't think we've seen any acquisitions at Blue Mountain and Sandy Lake in the last two years. So how do we measure progress towards these, these council priorities? Um, so thank you very much for hearing me out and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for that presentation. As, as a reminder, this is a presentation. It is an opportunity for you to uh, send information uh, or, or send your opinions or, or uh, express them to council. It is not a uh, question and answer. It's not a back and forth. Um, Un, un, that is reserved for uh, the councillors and, and uh, we can certainly ask questions of clarification of you, but I would recommend okay. that if you have uh, these questions that you forward them to uh, your councillor or all councillors and we can work uh, with staff to make sure that, uh, that your questions are, are answered. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions uh, from council uh, for Karen, uh, please. Uh, indicate in the chat if, if you would like to ask Karen any uh, questions of clarification. And I don't see any names in the chat. So Karen, again, if you could, uh, if you could send your questions along, we will, be, uh, we will be able to work with you and uh, get responses uh, for them. Okay, well, I will do that. And thank you very much for hearing from me today. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Ross Jefferson, and then we have Kelly Allen <laughs> and Wendy McDonald. Uh, Ross, I see you there on the screen. Uh, so go ahead, you've got five minutes. Great, uh, thank you very much. Good morning uh, to uh, members of council, your worship, and I'd like to recognize uh, Council Russell, the chair uh, of the uh, of the meeting this morning. My name is Ross Jefferson. I'm the president and CEO of Discover Halifax. Uh, thanks for the opportunity this morning. I requested this opportunity to speak in favor of a proposal included in your current budget plan. Specifically, I'd like to bring your, to your attention an allocation in the Parks and Recreation budget pertaining to special support for event development and programming. 
As council is aware, Discover Halifax is your destination marketing agency and has been assigned by you the responsibility for the development and advancement of the tourism industry for HRM. Throughout the course of the pandemic, our organization, along with several other partner agencies and municipal staff, have been working closely with the tourism industry on measures to support individuals and businesses impacted by the downturn in the tourism economy. As council has been made aware previously on our COVID recovery plan, the tourism industry and HRM contributes over $1.3 billion in direct spending annually to our region. It supports over 4,000 businesses and 34,000 jobs. This past year, our industry has been impacted dramatically with the estimated losses in visitation exceeding 85%. This loss is translated into significant job losses, business closures, and direct financial impacts to the tax base of HRM. In our estimation, property taxes from the tourism industry for HRM account for about $44 million annually, and this too is being impacted by this downturn. In an effort to mitigate these impacts and to expedite and accelerate our recovery, Discover Halifax is prepared and we are actioning on our COVID recovery plan. This plan includes several components, including assistance for opening of markets previously closed, a leisure marketing recovery plan, a business events recovery plan, and finally a program aimed at supporting events, programming and animations for the summer of 2021. Additionally, I'd like to bring to Council's attention that a significant portion of our region's tourism regular support efforts, and now our recovery efforts, are financed by a collection of a hotel levy in our region. With the decline in visitation this year, or I should say, um, uh, this includes a substantial portion of our operating budget. Discover Halifax represents 60% of the levy, and the remaining 40% of the hotel levy supports the Milsner Fund, which provides grants for events in our region. In total, this levy contributes approximately $4.1 million towards these efforts. With the decline in visitation this year, the revenues generated from the levy are estimated to be reduced by 85%, representing a decline of available funding to discover Halifax in the amount of 2.2 million and 1.3 million loss to the event funding reserve. Included in your budget in consideration is $150,000 to offset the $1.3 million loss in event reserve and an additional $650,000 to support the Parks and Recreation Department's effort to augment critical event programming and animation for the downtown and supporting regions in the summer of 2021. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to bring this to your attention and if appropriate, I'd be happy to take any questions about the recovery effort uh, or anything that, uh, that our, we are working on. Okay. Thank you very much, Russ. Uh, I appreciate uh, the information that you've presented. Uh, for any councillors who would like to ask questions of clarification, uh, go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ross, uh, good to see you. Thank you, Councillor, you too. Uh, so we all know and uh, how tough it has been for the tourism industry, uh, uh, you know, around the globe in Canada and particularly here in Nova Scotia. But, you know, could you speak to the opportunity, however, that's in front of us as the more vaccines go up, as we you know, every time we uh, hear a report about COVID-19 and we have the health professionals talk about who's doing it well, they refer to Atlantic Canada. Uh, and we know in talking to the Halifax Partnership, there's you know, there are, we had 15 uh, businesses that open up during COVID. We have a tremendous uh, conversation about uh, immigration wanting to come here as soon as the, uh, the international uh, voters uh, open up. Uh, could you speak to the opportunities in front of us? And one last point is, you know, we just have to look at the film industry and how it's been booming here because we've done such a good job and particularly in HRM, not only Nova Scotia, but particularly HRM. So could you speak to the opportunity that's in front of us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, I think uh, Nova Scotia has, uh, has been uh, very well off uh, in a comparative uh, perspective uh, for both health reasons and for our economy, as I understand. Our, generally, our economy is outperforming many other economies uh, and doing uh, exceptionally well. Uh, within the tourism industry, uh, I think it, it may actually be the, the opposite in many regards. Uh, the measures that have been put in place to protect other businesses and to also protect 
um, our communities have been uh, incredibly difficult uh, uh, on on our region for tourism. Uh, we can see that comparison uh, across other countries and across uh, other provinces and states as well. Um, and it isn't a, a, a complete um, a picture across all boards. Urban centers um, are very much impacted much more than our rural centers and rural communities. We are seeing upticks in camping, uh, and participation in uh, outdoor, um, more rural uh, communities are doing well. But the urban center is being uh, hit particularly hard. Uh, I will share with you uh, quickly that um, we do understand uh, the, the health crisis is still immediate and upon us right now in this country, but we are forecasting uh, and we have scenarios, uh, scenario planning completed that would see uh, the completion of the vaccination program for Canada and the rest of the world completing earlier than originally anticipated and an opportunity for a very strong and rapid recovery of the tourism uh, industry. The number one thing that we are working on right now is to make sure that our community is ready for that recovery. We are not trying to expedite an opening before it's time, but we wanna make sure when it is open that we assume uh, the, the opportunity before us, frankly, is that we have pole position. We have the opportunity to be first, to open first, uh, to get our air uh, access back first uh, and to uh, benefit from the opening first. Uh, and uh, th th this uh, investment that is proposed here ties directly to that strategy. Well, I, I think it's your new tagline, be first, open first and benefit from being first. I, I, I thank you, Ross, for your, uh, your consistent passion uh, for our municipality. Mr. Chair. Thank you, hey, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mancini. Uh, are there any other questions of clarification for Ross? Seeing none, uh, Ross, I would like to uh, thank you again this morning uh, for your presentation and the information and everything that uh, you have done for Halifax and bring to council. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Kelly Allen. Uh, Kelly, I see you on the screen, so go ahead. Uh, you have five minutes. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Allen, and I'm a mother of two children, ages nine and 11, who lives in HRM 13. I'm also a director of a not-for-profit called Roots and Boots Forest School, which offers outdoor education to children in HRM ages three to 12. Firstly, I'd like to thank my counselor, Pamela Lovelace, for informing me of the opportunity to speak with you today. She is doing a great job in HRM 13 in asset mapping, assessing the needs and developing a local recreation strategy to meet the needs of our communities in this large rural suburban area. Go Pam. I also applaud your work on the Adventure Earth Center and its incredibly popular outdoor programs. Sorry, I'm out of breath. <laughs> These are always oversold and the expansion to other areas are very much welcomed. I now speak generally to the current budget and business plan you're reviewing. COVID has presented us with many budgeting and planning challenges, and I do not envy your positions. While I approve of your overall approach, I would like to offer another perspective, that of outdoor education for youth for your consideration. Can I get a show of hands for those who are on the screen of those of you who have spent time playing outdoors in the woods as a child or youth? Anyone? Great, certainly some of all of our fondest and most vivid childhood memories happened while outside. While I can understand the importance of a $561,000, $227 subsidy for the St. Margaret's Bay Center during these uncertain times, perhaps there is a simpler approach to achieving your mission of meaningful recreational experiences that foster healthy lifestyles, vibrant communities, and sustainable environment. For example, programs such as those offered by Roots and Boots, which have been operating in HRM 13 and in District 1 since 2016, have a total operating budget of under $75,000 annually, 80% of which goes to staffing costs, and have achieved outcomes of play-based learning, nature immersion, developing a relationship with the land, and a desire to protect our beautiful environment. In five years, the Lewis Lake site alone, we have accumulated 39,134 outdoor hours with 686 children from HRM 13. Forest schools operate entirely outside 
It offers COVID safe activities such as swimming, canoeing, plant ID, fishing, hiking, geocaching, animal observations, yoga, loose parts play, crafting, tree climbing, reading, and learning simple hand tools, just to name a few. COVID has changed our relationship with nature. Everyone now wants outdoor recreation, especially for their children. While this offers some challenges during the winter season, there are simple solutions such as yurts, tents, cabins, and heated picnic shelters that are happening for minimal cost in other regions. We used to operate in a city park within a subdivision. This, however, was not sustainable due to the fact that there were no washroom facilities on site. As we grew, we moved to Jerry Lawrence Provincial Park, but are now unable to receive municipal funding due to the fact that we operate on provincial land. This is unacceptable. If your strategic priorities are to acquire and develop parkland this year, why not buy and use some for purposes that do not involve expensive playgrounds, which are not highly utilized, or manicured walking trails that are not fun for children under the age of 12. We know that recreation strengthens the mental health of youth, and we also know that parks are a huge asset in HRM. Your own document states, parkland, both maintained and natural, enhances the quality of life, physical, mental, and psychological well-being of the individual and the community in its entirety. Rather than maintaining equipment, operating sports fields, ball fields and courts, offering organized programs and subsidizing indoor rec facilities, why not invest in budget-friendly programs using Forest School as a model? Give access to woodlands so that organizations like ours can thrive and this will not cost you a dime. These places exist all over HRM. We just need permits. Let the volunteer and nonprofit sector enhance your capacity by alternate service delivery. Let trained forest school practitioners who are on the ground every day working with youth help you create the rural recreational strategy for 2021-2022. If you wish to stop funding short-term programs and create longer-term outcomes, I urge you to consider making HRM a leader in this regard. We have huge potential for being a sustainable model with employment opportunities in outdoor rec fields, tourism, for example, woods walks led by local experts and children like my own who are trained to become the leaders of our great city tomorrow. Kelly. Thank you for this opportunity to comment and share my passion with you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for sharing your passion. Uh, a friend of mine also runs a, a forest school out in your neck of the woods. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, ask for uh, any councillors who wish to ask Kelly questions of clarification uh, about the information that she has presented to us. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, really thrilled uh, with the work that you're doing in HRM 13. I wasn't aware that you're also in District 1, so that's that's fantastic. Um, personally, I think it's uh, a wonderful model. I think we've got a great opportunity here to grow. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I think is really important that you raised is about the washrooms and the washroom facilities and the fact that you're using a provincial park because of the fact that the facilities exist. Whereas with playgrounds, uh, they don't have access to those washroom facilities. And part of the issue I see is it's around the duration of play, right? Whereas the forest school, you're there for the day, you're having fun, you're doing great things. So you're going to need to have washroom facilities. Whereas with playgrounds, it's kind of a short spurt, right? Kids are going there for an hour uh, and then they're going back to their home or back to another facility to use the washrooms. And so I just wonder if, if you can speak to uh, sort of that journey for you to find a location with washrooms. Are you limited, uh, you know, in that it's washrooms are really only in provincial parks? I'm just wondering if you can give us a sense of that. We have found that we are very limited. Um, you know, it, it is a barrier. Having washrooms, especially accessible washrooms has been a very big journey for us. And there are very few places that provide that. Certainly, you know, when nature calls, if you're a kid, there's, there's some outdoor options, but when you're in a subdivision park, 
those are not acceptable for the vast majority of people. As well, some of the children that we're working with are as young as three and may not have a whole lot of lead time. So you do need to have maybe a porta potty. We use a, a pit toilet in Jerry Lawrence. Um, in District 1, we're using like a bucket system where we take in and out the waste so that it's sustainable for the land that we are operating on thanks to Fall River Chapel. Um, and I don't know if that's the correct answer, but essentially washrooms are a barrier. And I think programs like this could really thrive if we could get creative around some solutions for those. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions of clarification for Kelly? Please uh, indicate that in the chat. And I don't see any, so thank you very much, Kelly, for your presentation. Uh, we will take that into consideration uh, when we go through our discussions today. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it, and keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Wendy McDonald, and then Colin May after Wendy. Uh, Wendy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here this morning. Thank you. Wonderful. Hard Good to, to see you. Uh, go ahead. <clears throat> hard to follow that impassioned presentation. Um, difficult to put recreation in a box or a business unit as we are here to do today. Recreation is many things to many people, such as a safe and successful walk in their local neighborhood, a vision to include a functional or outdoor play space in a new development, retention of the urban tree canopy to allow nature to thrive and encourage an appreciation of nature and biodiversity, which has certainly been in the news this week from Province House. And personally, we're planning outdoor ed with a local school with the help of the Ducks Unlimited resource people. Just this morning, I observed a northern flicker on my backyard trees. So retention of trees is an important consideration as you um, go forward uh, across business units um, in your deliberations. Designation as a bird-friendly city with encouragement from Nature Canada and other folks is um, a positive event and you will be joining other Canadian cities, I, I trust. But I digress. I live in District 12, Mainland North. We have had a new councillor in each of the last five or six elections. We welcome Iona, our newest. It takes time to study and understand the needs and wants of a community. We now help to play catch up with Iona. Studies have been done for HRM rec facilities and it will be obvious that we lack functional parkland within a suggested 800 meters from most of the nearly 100 apartment and condo buildings with over 10,000 residents. <clears throat> Functional parkland is divide, defined in your report as an asset accompanied by an active play space. We don't have picnic tables or a gathering space for a group barbecue in these necessary outdoor times. What about a splash park, a community garden, or even a tennis court? <clears throat> As we do not have a community developer in our area, it's next to impossible to move forward <clears throat> toward accessing ideas or plans within HRM. Indoor rec is a similar sad state, perhaps, unless you are able to become a member of the Canada Games Center, which is out of reach for many of our residents. And there is little or no HRM pro rec programming available within mainland North, not even an informal drop-in for youth once held at school gyms. I acknowledge these are different times, but try to plan ahead for more positive <clears throat> recreation services in mainland North. And I'm embracing Fairview, Rockingham, Clayton Park, as well as my own neighborhood of Clayton Park West. Collaboration is key. 
<clears throat> as we've learned from Kelly, the nonprofit area, val volunteer community cannot do it all with limited resources. Many of the volunteers are tired and aging out of the giving back circles. And we have limited meeting space. We need something such as a, a hub, a new term, where groups can interact, network, store equipment, drop in and enhance community living. Age-friendly communities are a theme I've yet to hear more about and something as simple as more benches in our communities would um, enhance the healthy community motto. We want to communicate, bring your team to the area and let's talk virtually or in person <clears throat> once that is available. What happened to community engagement? Wendy, if I may, it is approaching five minutes. Okay. From an economic and business point of view, you're all excited about growth and attracting new business and young professionals, but they all need their play spaces too. So keep that in mind when promoting our positive city, whether it's for business or tourism. <clears throat> in summary, keep up the good work. I don't know whether you've had your tour of District 12 yet, but um, look around and see what we have or don't have, and I'd be glad to interact with any of you going forward. Thank you for allowing me to make a few uh, pointed remarks today. Thank you very much, Wendy, for uh, presenting that viewpoint on, on uh on the importance of, of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I would ask any, any councillors uh, who have questions of clarification to indicate that in the chat. Um, go ahead, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you very much, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And thank you so much, Wendy, for taking the time to um, view your opinions and ask your questions. Um, I disagree that you're not as passionate as our previous speaker. We've spent uh, time, a lot of time at the door um, discussing many environmental concerns in District 12. Um, I do agree with many of your points that uh, picnic tables, community rooms, uh, community gardens, splash pad, indoor rec. Um, we've all discussed, you and I have discussed that um, with Mainland North a few times and we're looking for some answers or some assistance in that direction. Um, as you said, and I will confirm, uh, the Canada Game Centre is rather expensive. Expensive. I, knew they, I know they do have a few subsidy um, programs, um, but not enough to represent or get a good chunk of District 12 in their centre. Um, I do realize and appreciate that a lot of your volunteers have put a lot of time into the environment, um, maintaining trees and the trails. And I agree that um, the group is tired. And I don't agree that they're necessarily aged because they don't act like they're aged, but uh, I do appreciate their time. Uh, as far as location hubs, I again, I agree with that. Um, CGC is one of the locations we used to meet at, and it's become expensive. And of course, due to COVID, um, participation in those uh, meeting areas is limited. We do need a place of our own to have our conversations um, that aren't going to be expensive for the group because the group has limited funds. And I agree um, that... Councillor Councillor Stoddard. If, oh, I, if I can interrupt, uh, as, as Councillor Cleary has pointed out in the chat, this is uh, for questions of clarification. Okay. Uh, we appreciate, uh, again, the information that you're bringing forward. Okay. But this is for seeking clarification from the speaker. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, just comments, Wendy. Uh, I don't have any questions because I already know your position and I agree 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are any other speakers uh, just asking questions of clarification of the speaker. 
and I don't see any. So thank you very much, Wendy, uh, for coming today and, and uh, addressing your concerns with us. Thank you, Wendy. Our next speaker on the list is Colin May, and Colin is joining us by phone. Uh, Colin, you should be able to press star six on your phone to unmute. At this point, we cannot hear you. Good morning. Good morning, Colin. We can hear you now. Uh, go ahead. You have Thank five you very minutes. much, sir. Thank you. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Hey. Thank you. My wife and I have lived in Dartmouth since 1974, and we moved down to Dahlia Street 38 years ago. And I am 100 yards from our house is the entrance to the Dartmouth Common. So it's been a big part of our life and the life of our children who have all moved away. Over the past uh, several years, the number of cyclists cycling through the park has increased considerably and will increase even more once the bikeway goes through our street. Now, I just want to raise one thing, is that uh, earlier, about two months ago, signs went up at virtually every entrance to the Dartmouth Common, and it simply said, you no winter maintenance, use at own risk. The two entrances where the sign didn't go are the entrances used by cyclists. And I, th I interpreted that to mean that uh, pedestrians were just not a priority, but cyclists were. Now, fortunately, the park staff did end up clearing the pathways because there are children that walk from the Park Avenue area and our street that walk up to Bicentennial, to walk up through the park, is the same sign also appeared in the children's playground at Bicentennial School. And here we are trying to encourage children to walk as much as possible. I just want to refer to the council to section 66 of the HRM charter which, describe, which is devoted to the Dartmouth Common. And in there, in, in subsection six, it says the municipality's activities, including planning development and activities pursuant to this section on the Dartmouth Common and any, acti any activities permitted by the municipality on the Dartmouth Common must be consistent with the following objectives, public access for all. Pedestrian priority safe and comfortable pedestrian circulation. Now, I pick the time when I walk in the park because cyclists generally just fly through the park, don't ring the bell. In fact, the, the latest episode I, I had as walking through the public cemetery, uh, a lady came whizzing by uh, from behind I shouted out, use your bell. And she stopped at the gate and she said, I'm sorry, I have a bell, but it doesn't work. So I'd like to, I'd like to see the parks department put signs up at every entrance indicating that pedestrians have priority. Uh, because that is what the statute says. They, they have signs up there that ask they ask cyclists to yield, but that is not the same as giving a notice that clearly states that in the whole of the Dartmouth Common, pedestrians have priority. And when I say, as far as I'm concerned, I give priority to people in a wheelchair or people who have a mobility device. And so uh, I've, in the past four years, there's a number of councillors have, have heard me talk about this both at the Active Transportation Committee, the, strand, the Standing Transportation Committee, the uh, Harbour East Marine Drive Community Council I've spoken about there, nothing's happened. And so, Mr. Chairman, I just say thank you for taking the time. Pedestrian priority, in fact, goes beyond the Dartmouth Common. I think we need pedestrian priority and wider sidewalks all over HRM. 
Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much uh, for the time, Colin. That uh, is, is certainly something that we are uh, going to be discussing or taking away. Um, we have seen uh, additional signs show up all over the place, and hopefully we can address that as well. I would ask for anybody who uh, has any questions of clarification for Colin to indicate that in the chat. Go ahead, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not so much a question, just wanted to acknowledge that uh, uh, I've heard Colin's uh, words and uh, I'm happy to follow up with him offline. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Austin. And I don't see any, uh, any further councillors uh, seeking questions of clarification. So Colin, I'd like to thank you again for uh, coming to uh, the Parks and Rec uh, budget meeting. And I'd like to thank all of the speakers for taking the time out of your day to uh, bring your, your concerns forward. At this point, I'd like to move along and, and we have uh, the staff presentation from the Parks and Rec department. And so I'm uh, going to turn the floor over to Denise Schofield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of council. And I'd also like to thank all the members of the public who've spoken today. Um, on behalf of the entire team, I am very pleased to be presenting the Parks and Recreation Budget and Business Plan today. It takes many people to prepare uh, a document and a, and a process such as this, and a number of them are here with me today. I will introduce the senior team a couple of slides later. We also have our coordinator and our financial analyst. And I would note Parks and Rec is slightly different than some of the other business units because the some of our major partner facilities fall under us. So the general managers of those facilities are normally in person with us, but because of uh, we're virtual, they are available to uh, answer questions, but they're not with us live. Next slide, please. I won't read read this slide. There's a lot of information in our uh, in our presentation today. This is a Parks and Recreation mission statement, which covers all of the numerous things that uh, that we do across the municipality. Next slide, please. So in terms of our structure, we have the executive director's office, my office, as well as uh, we're, we're structured with four divisions. Parks is managed by Ray Walsh, recreation programming, Angela Green, our regional recreation team by Maggie McDonald, and our uh, strategic planning and design by Nalini Naidu. Uh, all four of these individuals are with us today for specific questions. Slide, please. So each year, we, we like to give council a few little nuggets of information about us. I'll uh, quickly run through these things. We, uh, we have 67 recreation facilities, as, as council would be aware. Some, many of them are operated directly by HRM staff, but many of them are also operated by partners, our community partners. So uh, that's, that's a mix of, of our recreation programming. And we offer programs in, in both of those settings. This year, with the implementation of, of Legend Recreation software across our major facilities, we're actually able to report on the number of recreation programs, both in HRM operated facilities, as well as those partner facilities. With COVID, it has been a very challenging year. And then the number of programs that we were able to offer collectively is about half of what is a normal year because of all of the shutdowns. But one of, I guess, the, the benefits that COVID has given us is that because of the need for contract tracing and registration, we actually know, um, we, have, we have information now on the number of times that people have dropped in, thinking to open swims, to open gyms, unstructured play, the oval. So since we reopened the first time last summer, we've had just under 400,000 people drop into any kind of unstructured play activities. In terms of our parks capital, we last year we did 61 projects, capital projects in our parks. We're on track to do essentially the same number this year, 62. Uh, and council, those returning councils would be aware we are responsible for mowing of grass. Um, that is in the parks as well as along the right of way. All of those areas account for just over 6 million square meters of grass that our team is responsible to oversee the mowing of. Similarly, trash cans, I suspect council will be surprised to understand that we service trash can, our trash cans in our parks over, just over 100,000 times, that's uh, empty trash cans. We, uh, we have over a thousand trash cans in those parks and areas. So that, uh, 
the, the number of times that those get cleaned out each year is uh, equates to just over 100,000 times. Uh, our greenhouse, we have greenhouses that we cultivate planting. Most of the plants go into the public gardens, but we also have a number of plants uh, that go into some hanging baskets and median gardens, especially in the enhanced maintenance area. So we, we grow 80, just over 84,000 plants in those greenhouses. Uh, cultural spending oh, across the municipality and things like grants and tax exemptions, we support the cultural sector with uh, $2.78 million in, in funding support. And we have over 900 parks and those a prize of uh, just under 6,000 hectares. So 57, 21 hectares of parkland. This is a slide that we include each year. It just also gives a, a, a a, a laundry list of, uh, of the variety of things that fall under the Parks and Rec portfolio. We are ground truthing and asset truthing all of this information each year. So we update it each year with the, with act, as we, as we uh, get better data, but uh, we always include it so that council is aware and able to see the breadth of, of types of assets and things that, uh, that we're involved in. <coughs> This is a, a particular slide to give a bit of context. So as I noted with 67 recreation center facilities, a number of them are operated by partners. There are seven in particular that uh, council had previously directed us to do a review of. They're, they're commonly known as multi-district facilities or MDFs. People will, you'll often hear that. Those seven account for about 70% of the recreation offerings that HRM provides. So it's a significant portion of our, uh, our, our offerings. And they've had a, a number of similar impacts based on COVID that, uh, that HRM rec uh, offerings have had. The, the reason that they're included in our budget is that a number of years ago when we did, undertook this review, uh, we've entered into new management agreements with these facilities. And that, that requires them to present their budget and business plan to council through this process. So it's a part of this process and that includes any requested subsidies to be able to break even in an annual year. So I will be speaking in more detail later on in the presentation, but we wanted to give you a bit of an overview of why these, uh, why you would see the budgets for these facilities and the, and the budgets included in this presentation. So for your successes uh, in the last year, we reopened the St. Andrews Center. This is a, a purpose-built accessible building, which is uh, uh, replaces a, a former school that was not built for recreation. So we're now able to provide that community with, with a purpose-built building. We council, as you would recall, approved the municipal parks washroom and drinking fountain strategy. So that is now going to guide us in where we place new and replacement washrooms in our parks. We secured a significant amount of, of non-municipal funding. Most uh, the, the big ones, the, the federal funding for both the Sheet Harbor and the Beachville Lakeside Timberley facilities would be ones that our council's familiar with. But I also wanted to note that we, we also received funding for smaller projects like playground replacements, as well as uh, in particular this year, some of our virtual events. We're always looking to evolve our programming. And one, uh, one area that we looked into that or we, we worked on this year with COVID, we were not able to offer our parks playbox program, which uh, play boxes are in parks for, for residents to use. So the team adapted that to a backyard play box program. So residents could, similar to a library card, take out a play box for a couple of weeks, or sorry, similar to library books, they could take out a play box for a couple of weeks, play with it at home, return it back to our team. We would then ensure that it's sanitized properly before it's lent out, lend it out to another group. So this is something new that we did this year, which you know COVID required us to look at, look uh, to be creative. But it's some, certainly something that was definitely some interest in, the, especially in the rural areas. So we will be looking to continue that program in years in future years. Uh, council will be aware that uh, you have recently approved the integrated tourism master plan. This work was underway prior to the pandemic, uh, certainly was needed then, but now as, as Mr. Jefferson spoke in earlier, the impact of COVID on the tourism sector has been significant. So this, this guiding document is even more important now than ever. And finally, we have completed the, the bulk of the major components of the recreation software implementation. Um, 
one thing I would note, in addition to implementing that software in some of our major facilities, we were concurrently adapting that software because of COVID. We had to make changes a number of times. So we were, we were doing those two pieces of work at the concurrently. Speaking of COVID, COVID had a significant impact on parks and recreation. It impacted pretty much everything that we do. So a few things that we did in, in dealing with the COVID over the last year and continue to, to work through. So uh, as I noted with Legend software, having technology, we were now able to implement some tech, technology services that we in the past we wouldn't have been able to do so. So things like doing refunds for citizens back to credit cards, having on, uh, technology to do the, all of the contract tracing that's required through the public health uh, restrictions. Any of all of that that would have had to have been done manually before would have been a much longer process, would have been much more onerous for, for citizens. So that's certainly something that while we didn't want to go through a pandemic, it's certainly improvements that we were able to implement. We adapted our programming a lot. Um, we had to change programming a lot. We had to implement uh, hundreds of signs as across all areas of the municipality to ensure that residents knew what the changes for um, the, uh, the public health restrictions were, what that did to our programming. That was a, a significant amount of, of work. And we closed and reopened our parks, our trails, and our facilities a few times. Um, and, and that's not just opening and closing a building. There are a number of, of groups that use our facilities, that they book bookings. Our team would uh, lovingly referred that to the as the hokey pokey because we would every time that they we were required to change uh, or close or open or change the type of use of our facility all of the contracts that, that uh, user groups have with us to to book our spaces had to be changed so we would have to take them out put them in take them out a number of times uh, we're very appreciative of the patience that our citizens had with for us over this as we were trying to adapt to COVID restrictions and regulations for public health as much as they were. When our facilities were closed during the, especially the initial phases of, of COVID, the province requested that we allow them to use some space uh, as temporary homeless shelter. So we supported, supported that ask. We are, some of our facilities were used for, by the food bank to be able to set up a delivery uh, system in a way that they couldn't do in their normal facilities because of social distancing. And we did a number of locations and continue to have a number of locations for pop-up testing. That, uh, that is still going on. And it's an, an important part of the, the reason that we feel that HRM is, and, and Nova Scotia is doing so well under COVID is, is the number of people who are coming out to our facilities to uh, take advantage of that pop-up testing. We, uh, we were not able to have host our events as we normally would, things like Canada Day, Natal Day and the like, parades. Um, so our team adapted to switch to virtual. Uh, we were selected, HRM was selected as one of 12 cities that was part of the CBC's um, virtual Canada Day celebration. And as, uh, as, as many people uh, seem to appreciate, we also adapted to our, our Christmas season, our holiday season to the light shows both at City Hall and the downtown Dartmouth Post Office. <clears throat> Next slide, please. In terms of council's uh, priorities, we touch on a number of those. So in terms of safe communities, one of the biggest things that we'll continue to be focused on in the upcoming year is, is the pandemic. Um, we are still in the midst of that and it is still impacting both our programming, the ability to access our facilities. So, so we will continue to be working through the pandemic, adjusting as needed, as well as starting to review things, the changes that we had to make as a result of the pandemic, what we should keep and what we can change back to normal when, uh, when public health restrictions allow. Yes. Uh, in terms of involved communities, we do a num we're involved in a number of activities here. I'll just highlight a few. Uh, we will be advancing some cultural plans. Council would be aware that uh, you've directed us to undertake a museum strategy. That first phase of that is coming to a close. We'll be, we'll be bringing that back with uh, some, some recommendations on where we go from here now. Um, we also, a significant part of the work that we'll be doing on that is the commemorative plan for the Cogswell uh, project. That is a piece of work that this team will be undertaking. The real, Rural Recreation Strategy Council has 
heard it, started to hear about that. We've started to undertake the consultation and, and engagement for that work. That is a piece of work that we'll be completing this year. As I noted earlier, we have a number of partnerships, uh, everything from groups uh, who, who maintain some fields and all the way uh, through to operating major facilities. So we, we continue to work on those partnerships, strengthening them, modernizing, updating any all of the agreements that we have with, uh, with well over 150 partners. It's a, it's a significant amount of work, but and it's something we've been at for a number of years. And we, we continue to work through those, those groups and with, uh, with updating and modernizing our, those relationships. And finally, the youth engagement plan that we have is coming to the end. So we will be undertaking the, the, the youth engagement plan 2.0 and, and updating that document. Economic growth, as, uh, as I noted, the integrated tourism master plan is a significant part of economic growth, but it's also a significant guidance for economic recovery. So that document and implementing that document with Discover Halifax will, is, is already started and it will be under way really with a focus in the beginning on economic recovery, moving through to economic growth as, as we're able. And as well, as you would have heard Ross mention a discussion about uh, event delivery. So events are a significant part of, of uh, both the vibrancy of our city, but also an economic driver. There is an, a, an opportunity that I'll be mentioning in a later slide for us to undertake uh, a real focus on particular event delivery in the downtown cores. I think every, it's, not, uh, it's not surprising everyone that the downtown cores of cities all across this country have been hit even more so than other areas by COVID-19. And being able to bring some vibrancy back to, to the cities is, is a significant part and the downtown cores will, uh, will play a big role in that. So being able to provide some activity in the downtown core to attract both residents as well as visitors back to our cities is an important part, and that is something that council will be uh, asked to consider or able to consider in, in a later slide. Protected and sustainable environment. Uh, we're always in the midst of acquiring and develop parkland. That's a significant uh, focus of this team. As, as we as noted one of the speakers, we're focused on both the regional plan directives that uh, or initiatives that are, are outlined, things like Blue Mountain, uh, Sandy Lake, that kind of thing, as well as any other specific parkland parcels that council directs us throughout the year. The Halifax Common Open Space Master Plan, we were nearing completion of that when the pandemic hit. Uh, the shift of focus for this team to COVID-19 has delayed us slightly on that, but we're back focused on that now and we'll be bringing that back, we anticipate in this upcoming first quarter of, uh, of the, the new fiscal year. And finally, through the annual business, pro uh, business process, council approves a number of parks and open space plans that, that this team completes in the run of a year. We have a number of complex ones that were approved uh, over the last year that we're, we're working on. There's still some work to be done on those. So that's going to be our focus for the upcoming year. Things like completing um, the, uh, the, the West Bedford plan, the rehab plan, the off-leash area around Governor's Brook. We're also working on the management plan for Shaw Wilderness, as well as the entrance and the overall plan for Blue Mountain. We have the work that is uh, ongoing with Halifax Water related to Sawmill Creek and a park plan to complete that, uh, that piece of work. So that's our focus for the upcoming year to complete the ones that uh, basically either are almost complete or get a bit slightly derailed due to COVID. And that will be uh, where we bring, what we will be bringing back to council in the upcoming year. In terms of administrative priorities, it's uh, well managed. So the number of all of the strategic plans, some of them have been mentioned in earlier slides. We also have things like the playing field strategy, which will help inform how and wh where we locate playing fields, how they're managed in order to uh, maximize the efficient use of our fields and also ensure we have uh, the appropriate number, appropriate location of fields as well as we have a deliverable related to park standards that's been highlighted in both the green network plan and some of the other work that we've been doing. We're working on those standards, which will help inform everything from how we position our parks, what kind of assets are in parks as, and how we develop our parks. As you saw in the earlier slide, we have a number of assets, everything from small, um, flower beds to large scale facilities. We continue to work on our asset management. We're 
through the implementation of some technology things like city work legend uh, we're able to ensure we have the assets um, properly accounted for but also undertake a, a, an organized approach to inspection so that we're able to ensure that we keep all of our assets in a, in a state of good repair and finally we will we'll be bringing back this year the recreation fee by recreation re fee review as well as the administrative orders and bylaws needed for implementation for the the new councillors council had asked us to undertake this review uh, because our fees had not been been changed for a number of years we've been undertaking the various phases of that work this we're, we're now uh, at the point able or ready to bring back all of the phases complete and, and into one package so the council can consider that review in a whole we chose to with with the new council with the covid we chose to delay that and not have it brought back prior to this budget debate so we'll be bringing that in the this particular fiscal year for council's consideration customer service so with legend implementation largely the main components largely done we're now going to shift focus to those components that provide even better experience for our residents so things like online booking being able to um, do online loans of, of equipment and really have a shift of a focus to be able to allow residents to use that software to the, the, the full extent possible as well another aspect of our customer experience that we've been implementing over the last number of years is a lot more focus on what we call unstructured play and ability for um, all residents to access our program. So we'll continue to focus on the affordable access program and all of our unstructured play activities so, so that any resident is able to participate in recreation. And as I noted with, sorry, back one slide, please. Back, 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 sorry. One more. And finally, a recreation software, we will be with the, with the capital project complete, it's now shifting into an operational mode where we'll be able to mine the data that, that, that is in that software to help us make it, uh, use that data to form decisions on where our programming is, what type of programming, where the, where the interests are, where the trends are. Now we can forward. Some key performance indicators, um, we just note a few here. So weather was on our side this year, we were able to complete 93% of all of our capital parks projects. Um, because our projects are largely in, in um, natural areas, we are often uh, at the mercy of the weather as well as things like environmental permits. So, so we had a good year for, in terms of parks capital completion. Uh, requests for parks maintenance were down uh, a, a, a few points this year. Um, even though uh, many people were out in our parks, I think uh, that it, there was less um, structured activities happening in our parks, and I think that's probably what has triggered that slight reduction. With COVID and all of the the, the additional requirements for um, cleaning supplies and whatnot, we did increase the funding support that our partner facilities received th throughout the year to help them offset some of those costs. We had a slight uptake in our calls for uh, service calls for grass. Nine, nine additional calls over last year. So that's that's starting to level out a bit. Um, as well, uh, we had a, a significant drop in the funding that we provide to individuals to help access recreation programs. This is directly attributed in, to the fact that we had to re uh, reduce recreation programs across the board. There were less programs offered. So therefore there was less uh, requests to offset the cost for those those programs as we return back to full programming we're fully expecting that money to or that amount of money to go back to previous levels or even increase more and finally the there has there was no change really the number of people who access our our programs and, and book our programs online has essentially it, it started at around 80 percent when we first uh, launched the software and it's continuing to, to stay fairly steady. Next slide. So getting into the money. Uh, in terms of uh, Parks and Rec, as I noted, we've, we've been, we're significantly impacted by COVID. So in terms of this particular slide, for our operating budget, our expenses are higher than our COVID budget in June, but they're less than the budget that had been proposed in March. 
And the main reason for that is that we're trying, we're bringing back a lot of our casual staff, a lot of our expenses um, with operating or, or providing uh, our programs. What is really different for us this year is our revenue. Our revenue is significantly impacted. It was less than 50% of a reduction from um, in last year from what we would normally achieve. We're anticipating coming that, that revenue coming back in this year, but not fully back. We're not able to provide full program offerings. We, we were offering the programs, but we're not, allowed, not able to have the full number of people participating because of the COVID restrictions. So while our revenue is rebounding, it's not fully back. So as a result, our net budget has increased by 4.8% or 1.5 million over the June COVID budget. For our service areas, the primary changes across all of those service areas are, are collectively um, the return of our casual wages, the increased costs associated with the pandemic, with COVID and, and the, the restrictions that are in place, the reduced revenue, as well as some realignment of staff resources. That, those are the primary areas of change across all of the service areas. The main focus that I wanted to give on this particular slide is the second half of that table. So as I noted, where um, many of our facilities are operated by partners and the agreements that we have with these multi digital facilities require them to submit their budgets to council and, and highlight any of a subsidy or as well as, as, as any deficits that you're in. So as HRM facilities, any deficit that the facility uh, realizes at the end of the year, or by that matter, any surplus that they realize uh, accrues to HRM. So HRM is responsible. It, it shows up in our uh, consolidated financial statements. So we've highlighted here that these particular the, the facilities had the same level of impact um, as HRM operated facilities in terms of having to close, not being able to operate and offer as many programs, not being able to have as many people participating, and as a result. The, the, the five listed here have ended the year with a deficit, which, is, which will be included in HRM's consolidated financials. In terms of staffing, uh, we've had, we, we anticipate a few staffing changes in the upcoming year. They're primarily the result of the legend software switching from a capital project into operational. So we will have uh, two term positions, we'll, we'll convert to permanent positions, and then one capital position will convert into a, an operating or they'll, it will end up in the wage model. So that's the three new positions. And then we will end up with the corresponding term casual seasonal positions being, uh, being reduced. There were a few positions that council approved last year um, for Parks and Rec because of, the, of COVID and the fact that we had to uh, eliminate or, or cancel seasonals and casual positions, as well as the the way uh, the uh, hiring freeze, we weren't able to hire those positions or or realize those positions last year. So we will be implementing those this year. Slide, please. So, in terms of what changes in our budget, we we have compensation adjustments, staffing changes. Those are primarily the the, the changing positions from capital to operating, as I noted, as well as union increases, ISA increases, the collective of all of those changes. Our revenue adjustments, so we are anticipating our arena revenues will rebound somewhat, not fully, but rebounding somewhat. Uh, we were able to, at this point in time, as long as, uh, as, long as restrictions stay in place, we are able to book uh, ice time and, and dry floor time. Our revenue uh, restoration, we're anticipating our revenue will rebound about 75% for the first, and, until the fall and then come back fully to the, the previous COVID le levels later in the fall after everyone is vaccinated with the hope that uh, some of the public health restrictions that are still in place will be able to be, be eased. Our event sponsorship, we're anticipating to be decreased um, with our challenges being able to host events and with the impact on many corporate businesses, we're not anticipating that we will receive a number of, of the, the same amount of, of uh, co corporate sponsorship for our events that we would in a normal year. And then we also have one particular item that we've had, we've had to incorporate in our budget. So 
Uh, Council be aware, one of the events that was delayed was the North American Indigenous Games because it, it was not able to be held. There is still plans to host that event. Um, it is being discussed at, uh, at the federal and provincial and the North American uh, Indigenous Board level. At this point in time, there is not, we're not able to, to note a definitive timeline, but we don't anticipate um, it being certainly in this fiscal year. Our target included an expectation that there would be a recovery of any expense costs associated by the, the North American Indigenous Games team. Because that is on uh, deferral and isn't happening this year, we won't have recovery. We also won't have the expenses. They weren't included in the, the wage model, but there was an ex, uh, a recovery anticipated. Because we won't re realize that recovery, we need to, uh, our budget needs to absorb that amount. In terms of other budget adjustments, we are about 95%, uh, we received about 95% back of our casual wages. So we fully intend to, to be able to hire our, our casual staff back, as well as a, a, a majority of our various expense budgets, things like uh, supplies and whatnot for our programming has been put back in our budget. Because we have so much frontline staff and we're dealing with the public so much, we have fairly significant uh, personal protective gear associated with COVID. So that's a that's an added cost that's in our budget. Council to uh, in the March budget, the, the one that wasn't passed, council had approved an increase of 125,000 to the professional arts grant. That was deferred in the June COVID budget. It was, it was one of the cuts that was made. So we have included that back in as per council's original direction in this particular budget. Uh, we also have included funding, one-time funding for a public art piece at St. Andrews Center. The, uh, the, the fit up of that facility required the, all of the funding to be used as part of the capital project. So, but in order to comply with the public art policy, ensure we have public art in our facilities, we have uh, included, our, our budget includes funding to, to complete that piece and have it installed. We've had, there's funding included for the implementation of the new administrative order on recreational trail maintenance that council recently approved so that we can provide grants to trail groups for maintenance of trails. And we have a number of interdepartmental cost charges where I'm not gonna list them all off. You would have seen those in both Mr. Anguish's and Mr. Blackwood's presentation. So we're in the interest of time, I won't list uh, all of them, but they're, they're certainly, they're, they're definitely, they're things that were budgeted in parks and rec that, that really uh, fall better under those two business units. So those have been transferred out. And finally, we anticipate a regular churn of vacancy management. So as people leave, retire, take other jobs, the time that it takes to fill those positions will realize a savings. So all of those numbers together uh, result in our uh, budget target of $32,794,300. So the options for council to consider. So in terms of under budget items that you could consider if you wanted to, to reduce, we provide funding, council approves funding for the Discovery Center. It is in the budget. However, the, the uh, conditions are on it that count, it is subject to council approval every year. So if you wanted to reduce that amount this year, you have that option. You could reduce the professional art grant um, amount back the, and essentially defer another year, it, similar to what you did in June, it would mean that the funding for professional art grants would remain the same as the level that it is now. You would intend to increase it, but it is an option for you to consider if you so chose. And finally, while we ended up having to cut primarily all of the, the, cat, the seasonal staff last year, we, it wouldn't be prudent to cut the, those numbers again this year. There are about 15 students that are hired. If you wanted to um, consider reducing costs that way, that is an option. However, you know the the, the concern, like you say, with the with the cuts last year, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't recommend that you you do any further cutting of those cash of those seasonal positions because we really do need to uh, put get those positions in place this year to uh, undertake the maintenance. Of, of our parks, that especially some of the areas that weren't able to be done last year with, with, the, with COVID and the cuts. There are a lot more over options for council to consider in Parks and Rec. There's always interest in, uh, in things in Parks and Rec. So uh, the 
Council had uh, directed in in February, you had considered the integrated tourism master plan. And one of the items in there was funding, additional funding for Discover Halifax to, to start to implement that document, uh, especially as part of uh, with COVID recovery, that additional funding um, is 250,000. That was uh, indicated to be considered as a potential over item as through this budget debate. Similarly, you considered a report last September from a development of a development of Scotia for a piece of public art on the uh, the Queen's Mark development. There is a piece of public art that is being commissioned for that uh, particular location. It's a fairly significant piece of public art, and there has been a request to council that you, that you share in that at a cost of one hundred twenty five thousand. That is something that all similarly you would also uh, ask to be considered as part of the overs. The next two items are, are the parts of items that you can consider for essentially COVID recovery. The first one, $600,000, that is funding that HRM could implement a, um, a, a small scale COVID safe event program in the downtown cores. As I noted in my presentation, the downtown cores are a significant end economic engine of our, of our cities, but they've also been significantly impacted by COVID. So getting people and visitors back to the downtown, this would be a program that would happen primarily evenings over the weekends to attract, especially when the bubble opens, attract visitors as well as citizens into our downtown core so that they can, we can start to bring some vibrancy back to the downtown, support local businesses and really start to get our cities back, back uh, to, to essentially back to, to the vibrant city that it was prior to COVID. Similarly, and you heard a bit of this from uh, Ross Jefferson, there has been a number of, um, of working groups working on event attraction and event delivery as part of COVID recovery. We have event grant programs as council would be aware, but uh, the costs associated, people want to start to bring some in-person events back, um, and but the costs associated with COVID and the ability to really do those in a safe manner is, is, is expensive. So there has been a request that we consider a one-time supplemental grant program to help event organizers across HRM host whatever type of event that they can do in a safe manner and, uh, and offset some of the, the additional costs, either from reduced participation or from COVID increased costs. There are also three overs for council that are pending staff reports that we're working on and bringing back. One is the request that came to audit finance for um, a $7 million request for the art gallery of Nova Scotia. That will be coming back shortly. Similarly, the request from Neptune Theater for funding an additional funding amount of 100,000. And the, we also, uh, impacted by COVID was, is the DEN, so the Multi-Service Youth Center in Sackville. That was a pilot the council directed us to undertake and then come back with a report both on the uh, success of the pilot and recommendations on whether it should continue and whether it should be expanded. Those, all of those items, certainly um, we will be bringing those reports back to, for council to consider, for council's consideration. In, uh, in the coming months. However, they are listed here. If council wants to consider them through this budget process, you also have that means as well. And finally, in terms of pressure, as we noted, the, um, the budgets and business plans for these multi-district facilities are submitted as part of our budget. They are required to submit any request, their, their budget at showing at a break-even level with any subsidy that they are requesting to be able to meet that break even stand. So because of the impact of COVID and the reduced number of participants, the increased costs and whatnot, they have requested um, increased subsidies collectively of about 1.7 million. The details of that are on the next slide. So we can, you'll be able to see which facilities are requesting which amount. If we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the, the previous subsidy, the fifth column over is the amount, that my amount is included in the parks and recreation budget. The additional subsidy request is the impact of COVID this year on those operations. I won't go into the detail of all of the, the impacts if council 
uh, if those if those subsidies weren't provided to the facilities, that's all the details of those are listed in the, the business plans. And as I noted in my opening slide, uh, we don't have the general managers on this call live, but they are all available for questions should the budget committee have questions of, of anyone in particular. And with that, Mr. Chair, I tried to be as quick as I could, but there, there's a lot of information there. Uh, thank you for your time and your attention. We are now open for questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Denise, for uh, such an in-depth uh, presentation. Uh, the first speaker on the list is Councillor Othit. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Othit, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to begin by putting the motion on the floor. I move that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Parks and Recreation proposed 21-22 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the March 10th, 2021 staff report and supporting presentation by staff into the draft 2021-22 operating budget. So moved. Seconded, yeah, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Othet. And Denise, I want to start by thanking you for the presentation, obviously, but I also want to pay tribute for a few moments here to you and your team. Um, some of our colleagues here if, uh, haven't been around uh, as long as I have, uh, will realize that the last year was a real ride for you and, and your team. You pivoted, you innovated, you all the other wonderful buzzwords, that, uh, but you did it. And I don't know if I had a dime or a dollar for every time you and I and had to talk about what was going on as a result of some Friday afternoon changes from the Premier and Dr. Strang and how that your weekend would blow up and that of all your team, um, we'd be very wealthy. But I think your team has been absolutely outstanding. It's, uh, you've recast a budget. You've opened and closed parks. You've explained at nauseum the difference between trails and paths and what's uh, the difference between a, an HRM owned one and, a, and an NS and an uh, government owned one. You put up tape and signs, you took down tape and signs. Um, we dealt with parents and coaches and teams and players at rinks and soccer fields and football fields. Um, and, and, uh, and, and all the fans that wanted to watch them and those ch uh, constantly changing roles. So I want to pay tribute to you, but also to the folks in maintenance and operation, to parks planning and events uh, planning and uh, facility planning, the scheduling folks, uh, the facility uh, liaisons, everybody. I, th I was going to start enlisting some names and I said to my wife last night, I'm up to over 30 names of just people that I have dealt with. So I won't put you through that, but I want you to know that every one of these departments and you listed the people that reported to you, but everybody has people reporting to those folks that we have dealt with and they have been absolutely outstanding and it has not been nine to five Monday to Friday by any stretch. I don't know how we want to proceed with this, but Mr. Chair, I'm happy to, uh, in addition to moving this, I'm happy to put a couple of things on the uh, parking lot list. I'm wondering if we could combine the 150 for the grants program and the 600 for the events program to help uh, with COVID recovery. If you want them separately, that's fine. But I was just wondering, because okay. there are amazing. so many of them, if we could combine a couple of them, we might not be here all day. But uh, I'm happy to move those to the parking lot as well as uh, expressing my support for the overall budget and my incredible appreciation to the decent team. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have, uh, Councillor Othit has moved the uh, addition of the COVID recovery event program and the COVID event grant program uh, totaling $750,000. Uh, Councillor Mason has uh, seconded it. Uh, go ahead if you'd like to speak to a councillor out there. Well, I think that there is, and it's funny, I was talking about this with some of my colleagues the other day. I'm not big on uh, increasing spending and I'm not big on raising taxes, but sometimes you have to do what is right to help our community and to help businesses. And also, I truly believe that in many of these cases, and we'll see this when we talk about planning and development next week, sometimes there is an ROI or a return on investment on some of these things that we do spend money on. So I am very happy at least putting these into the parking lot. Uh, so we'll have a discussion another day on how we can help these groups and how we can help our uh, our downtown and, and other folks with uh, with some events when the when the rules continue to improve hopefully thank you chair thank you very much um councillor mason thank you mr chair so i guess uh 
you know, I, I support these. I think these are good. Frankly, there isn't anything in the overlist I wouldn't vote for, except of course that, you know, the question is how do you pay for it? But the answer could be the gas tax money that was announced last week. So my question is to the uh, CAO and the uh, CFO, uh, how are we going to square that circle? Because, you know, thank you, Denise, uh, your uh, uh, over list is actually, I think, exclusively one time items, which is great. Right. So it's not building in uh, structural problems that we have to find funding for in the future. It's uh, here are things we need to do now for this one time frame. And so, uh, you know, those are the ideal kind of things that gas tax or surpluses or even reserves would be used for, even though they're operational, unlike stuff that would be sustained year to year. So I'm. I'm concerned, I guess. I'm, I'm wondering, how do we square the circle? We, we have this 26 million bucks coming. Uh, I believe there's a report coming from the D, uh, CFO about it. How do we, uh, is it redundant for us to argue it out here about what we want to fund and don't want to fund when we have a report coming on gas tax and a lot of the stuff that might be in there might be these things. How are we going to make all this work? Well, that's a I'm not okay. Uh, Jane, if I can interrupt, uh, your audio is horrible. It's a very slow internet connection. Uh, this is better. No, uh, no, Luke, it's not I am your father. Yeah, it's that yeah. level of bad. I think you're gonna have to restart your computer, Jane. I'm sorry. Or, or phone in. <laughs> is there? Thank you. Is there someone else who can uh, step in in Jane's stead? Um, or Councillor Mason, would you like to come back? Um, I think it's a great question. We don't have to pause I, here. I think it's we, a great when, question. When she comes back, we can have the answer at that time. I, I, I'm happy to come back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't know if the folks from Zoom are listening, but just FYI, that would be a really great audio filter if you could have that for your uh, for your Zoom calls. Um, so I support this, and I you know I'll support it as a combined motion, or or we could vote on each one individually. I don't mind debating these simultaneously and then breaking them up and voting for the six and the one fifty. Uh, I support both of them. Uh, it is important that we support our business community and also um, this kind of outdoor COVID safe uh, events, whatever they happen to be, are exactly the kind of things. I mean, we just, you know, heard from, um, from Ross from Discover Halifax, uh, you know, uh, there's no group suffering more than those in hospitality and tourism. And uh, whether they're out in uh, you know, uh, the Councillor Lovelace's area or whether they're downtown, I think they deserve support. And obviously the ones downtown, because many businesses and governments have allowed their employees to work from home or have, have just, you know, been able to shutter offices entirely. The downtown is probably hurting, you know, as much as anywhere, and especially the restaurants and bars and, and, uh, and other um, uh, venues that rely on folks being in the area. And if you're, if you don't have tourists and you don't have workers, uh, you don't have a whole lot of business. So I'll definitely support that. And as Councillor Mason uh, indicated, these are pretty much all one-time things. And so, you know, whether it's surplus, um, whether it is uh, the, um, in quotes, uh, I, I forget what the new term is, perhaps the mayor can, can interject. I remember hearing him say it, but it's not called the gas tax money anymore. It's called the something infrastructure money or those, I don't know, whatever it was, um, you know, that is something that we could definitely use and uh, we should use. I mean, it's incumbent upon us to do whatever we can to help those folks suffering most do better. And we are so limited in our ability to do that, that this is one area where I think we should take advantage of it because we are allowed to do it. So that's my uh, the thinking on this. And I thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I fully support both of these. I was going to uh, uh, put them on the uh, on the floor also. And thank you for Councillor Outhead. In particular, I'd like to support the uh, COVID event grant program. You know, as uh, as one of the presenters mentioned earlier, uh, Ross. You know, I've been on SEAC since I've been elected, 
And I've seen firsthand what these events have done for our, our municipality. And the hotel tax levy obviously is almost non-existent because nobody's been in the hotels in this past year. So everything that we can do to support these events, because these events will bring uh, people into our community once they're allowed to come into our community. And so I hope colleagues will support to get this on the parking lot. And obviously, we'll have that big debate on that day when we discuss all the parking lot items. But uh, I, I, I hope everyone supports it. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a mention to uh, everybody around the table, this is a single motion. Uh, we can't have two motions on the table at once. So this is one motion for seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Mr. Mayor, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair. And I was going to move those two plus the uh, Discover Halifax one together. Uh, I'm quite happy that we're doing these two. We can discuss the other one when the time comes. So to what councillors uh, have said already, um, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we actually help those businesses that are hurt the most? And there aren't that many ways. Holistically, we can do it on the tax rate. Um, but this is specific targeted ways that we can help. I think people need to understand something that Ross told me a few weeks ago and that Denise has heard me say at meetings that we've been at on this topic. The inequity of COVID is one of the big tragedies. So while the city's done well overall, you know, the hospitality hasn't. But even within the hospitality industry, there's been great discrepancy. You know, White Point and places like that have done quite well. People have gone to resorts last year. What Ross told me last year uh, was that there were people who came to Halifax, booked five nights at a hotel with their family and left after two because there was no events in the city that they normally expect. They went to restaurants for a couple of days and then they went, you know, if you go somewhere else, you go to the beach, you don't expect events, but a city thrives and lives on the vibrancy of the, uh, uh, of, of the downtown core, our main streets, our bids. And so working with the bids, this is what we've uh, come up with. We have hotels in Halifax that are less than 15% full last year. I mean, think about that. So it's hotels, it's bars, it's restaurants. And also what this fund will help is our cultural industries. It'll help our musicians. It'll provide opportunities for people to actually make a few dollars because um, they often got uh, forgotten last, last year. So number one is we can target, this is awesome stuff to do um, and it has the support of the, of the communities and the bids. Uh, number two to what Councillor Mason said, most of what Denise is looking for, and I'll speak to this a bit more when I get a chance on the main motion, but. These are all largely, largely one-time asks. And we can take some of the gas tax money. We can take reserves on some of these. Jane will come back in a month or so. She'll look at the reserve list. She'll say, this is, if you want to fund it, this is how you're going to do it. And this is not, primarily, it's not ongoing stuff. So uh, for me, it's easy to support these. As Councillor Earth had said, there's a return on investment um, on these. And it really helps us to help those industries, which have helped Halifax to six years of consecutive tourism growth until last year. We want to get it back. We want to get that pole position. And this is a very um, important way that the city can help. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Outhead, for bringing it forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane Fraser, our CFO, has uh, returned. So I'd like to hand the floor to her to respond to Councillor Mason from a few minutes ago. Welcome back, Jane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is the audio better now? Uh, it is far better, yes. Great, thank you. Um, so you, similar to, to what the mayor just said, um, what we do when we come back with, with the ballot list is that we will look at various er areas. We're looking at revenue sources to see um, what those are looking at. Um, you'll remember fiscal was done in, in early January. Um, and so there was still a lot of uh, uh, hesitancy around uh, what we thought would be happening in, in um, housing markets and things like that. So there's a number of sources that we will be looking at to, uh, to fund this. As, as you pointed out, and as, as councillors hear me say, uh, every year it is important to match um, the revenue source with the, uh, with the expense. So this is one-time funding and we'll be, we have a lot more flexibility uh, in, uh, in these types of, of items as opposed to ongoing, which we tend to put to the, uh, put to the tax rate. So, so there are a number of, of levers that we will be, uh, will be uh, looking at when we come back uh, on, I think, April the 20th. I hope that answered your question, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mason? Yeah, that does answer my question. And uh, so it gives us a quandary, right? Because I feel like as these are all one-offs that perhaps the appropriate motion is to move them all in for consideration with that report coming back and that analysis. But uh, I will support the motion on the floor now and I'll come back to speak to the main motion when time comes. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just a, um, a comment on the funding. I mean, I, I completely appreciate um, where businesses have been most hurt by COVID. Um, but I'm, you know, just wondering if we could expand. Right? This is really focused on the regional center. And in that regional center, I know we get, you know, things get left out like Eastern Passage, like Spryfield, the communities on the periphery, which also might you know, when, particularly when I think about Eastern Passage, um, that also have tourism and, um, um, you know, traditionally hosted different kinds of events. And I'm wondering about how we might be able to have a little flexibility in that fund to expand. And the other piece, when I look at the overs, we had that presentation by Neptune and how these grants might or might not support those facilities and organizations that are even in the regional center that have experienced um, a significant revenue um, cut due to due to COVID. So, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, we have that 100,000 ask from Neptune, we're looking at doing these grants focused on the regional center, you know, will those grants be available to support organizations like Neptune? And so that's question one. And the other one is kind of, you know, looking at perhaps just a little bit of an expansion beyond the regional center, I'm assuming the regional center is defined by the center plan boundaries. Is that how we define the regional center or how do we define that? So, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor, a couple of things, I'll, I'll cover a couple of things here, councillor. So the, the, the reason that the, the two pieces of, of, of uh, options there for you to consider. So in terms of the event, the one-time event grant, that is intended to support any event organizations who uh, wish to apply to it. So that, that would be any event organizations across the municipality. So we, we currently have two other event programs, the marketing levy special events, which is the big scale economic driver events, as well as the regional events. They have very specific uh, criteria for which groups can uh, apply and, what, and how they are distributed. This one would be over and above that, and it would apply to any, any event organizations across the municipality if they, if they wanted to apply for it. So right now, all of those event organizations are figuring out, are they able to do in-person? Are they going to do virtual? Are they going to cancel for the year? Are they going to do a hybrid? Because, of course, uh, with the public health restrictions, it's impacting, depending on the type of event, very differently. So th that the 150 option, um, if council so chose that, that is available across the entire municipality. The 600,000 for the event delivery, that's actually HRM delivering events in the downtown core. So downtown Halifax, downtown Dartmouth. It's, it's focused in those areas primarily because it's, uh, they've been hard hit, but it's also in the sense of, from a logistical point of view, what we would be looking to do is setting up a stage, essentially downtown Dartmouth, downtown Halifax and, and circle events through there on a, on a weekend or weekly basis. So, that cost would be significantly higher if we were to move that event activity around the municipality because we're getting economies of scale by being able to set up once and then have the events happening in that area. But the other reason for the focus on the downtown areas is, is many of our, what, while the entire municipality, there's been impacts across the municipality by COVID, the, it is consistently significantly impacted in the two downtown cores. And for all the reasons that many of the other members have mentioned, uh, with so many businesses not having their staff in the offices for tourism not being able to happen that and that's where a lot of our restaurants and, and hotels and whatnot are located that's where the impact has been felt the most and the study, there's been studies done that's across the country the downtown core areas have been hit the hardest by covid so that's what the 600,000 is intent was would be intended to do is actually focus that activity in the downtown core the 150 would be across the municipality Hope that helps. Okay, and my other question was just um, access for funding for organizations. Sorry, like sorry, yeah. So, so Neptune. So we have the the professional arts grant program that it was also mentioned. That um, Neptune applies to that. The the hundred thousand dollar ask that they have put in is over and above that. So council could 
We've, we've noted that in the presentation. You've asked for a staff report. We're coming back with that staff report once we complete all of the analysis. You could decide today uh, or through this process that you want to put that money in the parking lot regardless of a staff report, or you could wait until the staff report comes back and consider it at that time. So that's in terms of this event program, um, unless Neptune likely wouldn't apply to this 150 because it's really for focused on events that are happening in, across the community. So parades, barbecues, those kinds of things. They do apply for the professional arts program. And that's also, um, like I, I mentioned in my presentation, we have included the increase of 125,000 that council had approved last year before it had to get suspended during COVID. So that will increase the capacity in that professional arts grant program for groups like Neptune Symphony, other theaters to apply for. But Neptune's also asked for an additional 100 over and above. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh... Thank you very much, Denise. This has been really helpful. Um, as well, thank you, Councillor Cuddle, for being so thoughtful around District 3 and Fisherman's Cove and Eastern Passage in that area. I have similar questions. Um, uh, I am absolutely all for supporting economic development opportunities. I uh, express that throughout my campaign. I continue to express it to, to our businesses and um, service agencies who are all working hard to deliver uh, opportunities for our, our consumers. Um, so, I, and, and I can absolutely appreciate the, down, appreciate the downtown core impact. I, I absolutely um, get that. What I want to understand is, do we have information around the impact, what that looks like outside of the downtown core. I think that that's information that I certainly would like to have around our small businesses, around, and I think about the Baker Drive commercial area, the Woodlawn commercial area, the Main Street commercial area, the Eastern Passage commercial area, like there's just so many um, that are not gonna be captured in this. And I, and I, I, I would really like um, to get a little better understanding. It doesn't have to be today, but it could be in the future, uh, a conversation with you, Denise, on what, what we know, what, what do we know about that? Because I think there's a really important piece that we often forget when we look at the big picture, which is the downtown, is that there's a lot of small businesses who have always operated out of their homes, but they operate in a way that they have to go to locations to sell their wares. They have to go to, to events and communities, not just in their own community, but around. And all of those have gone, they've disappeared. And those are feeding their families. And so I, I really, um, I don't wanna lose track of that small local business impact that needs attention as, as well. Is it as large scale as the urban center? No, but it's it for for these families who are relying on these businesses that have invested so much for so long. Um, COVID nineteen has wreaked havoc on them as well. So I just want to raise that and throw that out there. The Halifax and the Dartmouth areas of the downtown are great. What I and I love the idea of HRM being the deliver deliverer and setting up the 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 venues and the and the locations for some uh, events around that what i again i looked out to the outlying and i wonder this covid event grant that is the 150,000 is this going to be restricted only to the outside outside of the um, downtown center because if we're putting the 600,000 into the downtown centers um, and, and I don't mean for this, for this to be disrespectful of those who might want to engage in event planning in those areas, but they're getting the brunt, sorry, the heaviest impact from the municipal money, the taxpayer dollars in that area. Can we somehow, can we de dedicate this 150,000? And then I ask, is that even enough for all, for the outlying areas only outside of the center? I, what I would want, not want to see happen, 150,000 is not very much. It's not going to go very far if we have all of HRM being able to apply for, for that money. Um, 
So I just, I, I guess I need some insight from Denise if, if there is a capacity or a will uh, to consider that. And if there is, if we think there is, I, I would consider even amending that motion so that it is, a, it is directed towards the, those areas that are not within the downtown center. Let's start there. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair, so you, you do the counselor. Um, so in terms of the impact on the economic areas kind of beyond the, the city center, I believe some of that work is being done right now by um, the partnership, Halifax partnership, because there's there's been studies across the country, primarily on the downtown core, but I know that there's, um, more work being done on kind of the, the full impact of COVID across many, many sectors. So I think that is part of the work that's being done there. In terms of the event grant program, the reason, so at this point in time, this is as, as council can probably uh, appreciate, it's, it's an evolving situation because of course it's always, it's impacted by where public health stands and where the, the levels of, of epidemiology are and the vaccines and all that. This funding is part of the discussion that we're having with a broader event recovery uh, working group. So we haven't put any restrictions on it at this point in time, but staff haven't recommended any restrictions because it is still a piece of the work that we're working on on how best to get that out. Council obviously always has the ability if you wanted to, to structure it so it was only in a certain area, my recommendation would be to give as much flexibility at this point in time so that we can um, have as much impact as possible. And, and you're right, Councillor, the, the, if, if the city is focused on the downtown core, there's likely uh, more interest in, in the more um, suburban rural areas. That's where a lot of our community events happen anyway. The, the, the city, the downtown core tends not to have as many what we would call community events because the activity of the city tends to happen. So this would supplement the other two grant programs that we have where so we have uh just over two hundred thousand dollars that it's, is also provided to those community events so some of this would supplement that as well so you you have the ability if you wanted to put a restriction on this my recommendation would be to leave it as open as possible so that we can um, implement it in a way that's the most effective and not tie our hands but that's certainly your council's uh a prerogative if you, if you wanted to do that Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, colleagues. And, uh, you know, on, on this one, I find where I, I, I often feel I sit somewhere in between. I mean, downtown Dartmouth is an urban place, but it's not, it, it, it isn't downtown Halifax. It runs very differently. It is more of a, it is more of a, a dense urban neighborhood than it is a downtown destination. We don't have the office market that downtown Halifax does or the, or the big commuter shed. Um, it is still a part of downtown, but it's nowhere near as downtown Halifax. Um, so I would encourage us to actually to, to not think about this in a parochial sort of way, to think about this as a city uh, building uh, exercise, because, you know, to, to, to draw on some of the stuff I've heard from Ross Jefferson over the years, um, it, our big selling point here in HRM in terms of um, a destination is we are the big city experience of Atlantic Canada. So when you think about like our tourism market has greatly retracted, um, who are we going to potentially be drawing from right now? It's people who live in PI, it's people who live in New Brunswick, it's Newfoundland, it's rural Nova Scotia. What's the thing that we have that sets us apart in that tourism market? It's not lighthouses, it's not beaches. We have those all over our region. It is, we have the big city experience. If you want to go and, you know, go to a restaurant, see an event, do a show, this is the place to do it in Atlantic Canada. This is our main competitive advantage, our selling point. Um, and then we're also the shopping destination. And, you know, if you can convince these people to come here for the weekend, there's a good chance they're not going to just stay in the downtown core. Um, they might go head out to Sackville to go to lunch, go to Mount um, Uniac House, go down to the boardwalk in Eastern Passage while they're here. Uh, this is not a zero sum thing by any means. This is about leveraging the biggest advantage we have in our current tourism market and playing it to its utmost. So I, you know, I think we should leave these funds, uh, the 150 open-ended, and to me, it makes sense to target the event grants 
uh, or sorry, the events that we can put on in the way that's going to do the most good for our economy and for our businesses. So that, that's where I'm at, uh, Mr. Chair. I support adding this to the parking lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any further speakers in the list. Um, so I'm going to call for the question and hand it over to the clerk. Beginning with District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Chair Russell. In favor? 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. Thank you, that motion passes. We are back on the main motion and Councillor Mancini, go ahead. Councillor Mancini, are you with us? Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, for some reason, it kicked back on its own. Thank you. Um, Denise, I want to echo uh, Councillor Outhead's comments about uh, you personally. I know during COVID, and this is over a year now, uh, the number of hours, tires hours you put into this and your team, uh, fantastic. Thank you for that leadership. Uh, and your staff has always been good. Uh, we, uh, they uh, always very responsive. So moving on, I have a number of questions in, in my time here. Uh, so the... The Discovery Center uh, under 145K, I have a question about that. Uh, uh, is that just for this year that you're suggesting that uh, we do not pay for them on that? And also, I wanted to understand, uh, you, you know, wasn't there a five-year agreement I thought we had voted on with the Discovery Center? So if you could speak to that, uh, please. Uh, the multi-district uh, requests uh, on slide 22, just want to uh, understand that. I, I just want to confirm that is included in your budget. Is that, is that correct? If you could speak to that. And I, the, we already spoke about uh, with the items we just added to the, uh, uh, the parking lot. Um, in your slide, uh, four, I believe slide uh, uh, four with all of our assets. Uh, one of the assets I see that's missing from that slide is our uh, 14 uh, dirt pump tracks uh, is not there uh, on that slide. Now we have a paved one. Uh, and my concern is that Every year we have to uh, upgrade and maintain those pump tracks. Uh, and unfortunately, they don't really get touched until later in the season. And really, I would like to see Denise, a strategy on hitting those pump tracks earlier in the spring so that those that use them, and many of our youth uh, use those dirt pump tracks that are throughout the HRM, but see if we can tackle that uh, the maintenance of those pump tracks earlier rather than later. So if you could speak to that, and I, I see a lack of strategy around that, but if you could speak to that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll leave those for now because I do want to come back and talk about the gray arena. Uh, but I'll, uh, And so I don't eat up all my time and uh, uh, counselor, uh, the chair cuts me off. So if you could just speak to those and I'll come back about the gray. Sure, counselor, thank you. And, uh, and also, um, the deputy mayor's comments on um, the team was incredible over the year and you know i appreciate the thanks for me but really the team is the, uh, the team is the one who opened the parks closed the parks and redid the the schedules and as you said put the signs up i and did the i am sit around and watch uh, fly, uh friday afternoon at three o'clock in the early months to watch what was going to happen Yes, there was a lot of watching to see how we were going to be impacted. So on behalf of the entire team, thank you very much for your comments because they did, they did yeoman service. And I don't think anybody realizes how much they had to do to, to keep the business running. 
In terms of your question, so the Discover Halifax, you're right, we've, you have approved an agreement, but it, it is contingent each year on, capital, on council's budget deliberation. So you have the option to, to defer or to not provide that funding in a year. Would it have an impact on, on this facility or on Discover Halifax? Abs or sorry, on Discovery Center? You're too, the, the names are too close. Absolutely. But it is an option that council has if you wanted to execute that option because each year the funding is um, specifically indicated that it's pending council's budget decision. In terms of the MDF request on slide 22, the 1.505 is included in our budget. The additional subsidy that has been caused because or has been requested because of the impacts of COVID, the 1.757 is not in our budget. So that would be a pressure that if council wanted to um, essentially provide, if, if you want those facilities to operate in a break even manner without having to impact their programming, that's the additional funding that they would be required to provide as a subsidy to those organizations. Having said that, the you know they provide their budgets or sorry they provide financial reporting throughout the year. If if we recovered faster, if there was more revenue recovery, we may not need to have to provide all of that subsidy. But at this point in time, based on the public health restrictions that are in place and the assumptions, you know, crystal ball that we've all had to use to. Uh, determine when life will go back to normal. That is the amount of money in order to keep those buildings operational and keep them uh, um, whole, I guess you'd say, or balanced. In terms of the the, the pump, the bike pump tracks, those are included. They're, they're considered bike tracks on slide four. So they're lumped in all of that. And as I said, we're doing ground truthing of all of our asset inventory. As we kind of um, update all of that information, you know, we, we, we have more specific data, but right now they are in that, grouped in that category. In terms of um, strategies. So, so is there a budget put aside specifically for those bump tracks to be made, or is it grouped in? That's my concern because we see them used and we see the residents trying to fix them on their own and it's actually counterproductive because the residents aren't experts on these bump tracks. So there's, it's, they're, they're an asset that we do all of our, our maintenance money is included for all of our assets. It's not specifically set aside for any one asset. I do know, I, you know, I can ask Mr. Walsh to, to chime in. I know that, well, we didn't have the staff to do maintenance last year. I know that he has this strategy for this upcoming year. Part of the challenge for parks, as council would be aware, is our staff go to TPW for snow and ice. So by the time with, with these, with um, the climate changing and, you know, looking outside the beautiful sunny day today, our, with, it, with the world, or I guess climate changing and it's getting nicer earlier, um, it, it is something that we're looking at in terms of where, how best to manage our assets and get ready. Because citizens, as soon as the snow's gone, citizens want to get back out. Oftentimes our staff are still uh, on the snow plan. So it is something that we're, we are actively looking at. Um, the seasonals certainly help, uh, you know, having the seasonals come on board each year that's where the majority of our summer maintenance happens. So whether, you know, we look at doing that a bit earlier, there's, there's a number of things that we're looking at there, but yes, definitely for this year, Ray has a plan for um, maintenance of those bike paths. Thank you. Mr. Chair, could you put me on for a second time, please? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Denise, um, you're the hardest working person in show business. Uh, you know, uh, I quite often I'll see Denise at events and because I'm not very good at remembering titles, I, I, I used to introduce her as the director of fun and games uh, for the municipality. Well, last year was not fun and games. Um, it's never is, it, it never is, but last year, well, last year at this time, colleagues, we were, we were deep in the beginning still of COVID and the rules were changing all the time. We, we, we mentioned, you know, we'd get a notice that I went out and did a video at the request of our folks in the province encouraging people to get out to the trails and the next day they shut down the trails for most people. So um, things changed and Denise, the work you did was really uh, quite amazing with all of the stuff that you and your team uh, have done. And I think they're all excellent, I really do. Um, and then when, as we could, we started to do things to support. The, the animation of City Hall was a tremendous success. And uh, 
um, our amazing SWAT team of special events guys. Uh, that's part of your crew and you and Elizabeth, right? And uh, I, look, I think that they could bring world peace if we gave them enough time. So, so there's just some amazing stuff that's happened. I want to, and it's not very often I look at over items and say that I could probably support them all, but as Way said, uh, Councillor Mason said, I'm kind of, my head is, is pretty close to that and a lot of them are one time. Uh, one, one uh, some of them aren't. I want to uh, put forward, Mr. Uh, Chair, that uh, into the parking lot, the Discover Halifax Destination Management Integrated Tourism Master Plan COVID Recovery of, I think it was $250,000. I'd like to, uh, I don't know that we need a briefing note because we just had the report from, from uh, Ross in the last month, but if that's what's necessary, I'm fine with that as well. But I'd like to put it there um, and I'll just speak to it very briefly if there's a second or four. Second, Mancini. Second. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Ross Jefferson, wouldn't you couldn't have faulted him last year if he had kind of gone into a hole for three months because of what happened to his industry and as i said we had hotels that were 15 percent capacity which would normally in the summer have been at 97 percent capacity and and he kept working he kept pushing he kept saying look we, we we need to be ready and in the last number of months he's been an inveterate optimist about what's going to happen we can't push public health this province has benefited from our public health approach to COVID. And we will benefit for years to come uh, because of it. Um, but as he sometimes says, it does kind of put us in the pole position that I'd rather be ready for activities this summer and not be able to do them than not be ready uh, and, be, and, and then have somebody else do them. That we have an opportunity in Halifax because of COVID, the way we managed it, because of the wonderful destinations that we have, we have an opportunity to do great things. So this. You know, I, I was asked to co-chair the um, tourism master plan before um, COVID. Denise was uh, uh, very much part of that. I think Maggie was as well, um, Denise. And it was amazing how they looked at this. HRM wide. I mean, the board of directors of Discover Halifax, we've got Doug from the canteen in Dartmouth, uh, Ryan Murphy from Councillor Hensby's district, uh, Murphy's uh, camping and out by the 100 Wild Islands. The approach that Discover Halifax has taken to all of HRM, the entire municipality, um, is, is, is really something that gives me great, uh, great pride. And that what Ross always says is, you know, a tourism plan is not about just beds and heads. It's about building a better community and that people want to come. You know, what's the impact that Airbnb has on our housing? You know, what if we have places that are over tourists? Um, so all that stuff, that real stuff was taken into account. and. Uh, uh, Michelle McKenzie, who, who did some of the work on that, said, uh, and I'm not sure if Ross said this, the council um, said, you know, it wasn't the best time to launch our master plan, but it was the best time to have one once COVID hit. And I think that that's very true for all of HRM, for all of our businesses, uh, for all of the people who've struggled over the last year, but have stayed at it and need a little bit of help. Um, I hope that we can support that uh, approach uh, of putting the Discover Halifax Destination Management destination management integrated plan into the parking lot and have Jane come back and figure out how we're going to pay for it. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, if there are any other speakers, uh, please uh, put your name in the chat. Uh, just for the record, the, the motion that is in the chat is that the budget committee include $250,000 in ongoing funding for costs associated with Discover Halifax Destination Management Integrated Tourism Master Plan COVID Recovery within the proposed 2021-22 Parks and Recreation Budget uh, in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. And because we missed it earlier, the previous motion, the one that we've already voted on, was that the Budget Committee include $750,000 in one-time funding costs associated with a COVID recovery event and a COVID event grant program within the proposed 2021-22 Parks and Recreation budget in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. I don't see any further speakers. Uh, all for the, the question has been called, uh, so let's hand it over to the clerk. Beginning with District 15, Chair Russell. In favor? 16, Deputy Mayor Otet. Yes. One, Councilor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Absolutely Four. affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Favor. Four, Councillor Purdy.
Sorry, in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. And Mayor Savage. In favor. Thank you, uh, that passes. So we are back on the main motion and Councillor Austin, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Denise, for all the work your team does. Uh, as Councillor Oat had noted right off the front, uh, what a challenging year, three o'clock announcements, everything like that. Um, and, and to do all the work too with a fraction of the staff that you'd normally have in the parks, right? So it's, it's much appreciated. Um, I, I just quickly, uh, very happy to see the Sawmill River piece um, in there on the planning section. Uh, we do have an opportunity there with Halifax Water, but it is somewhat time sensitive. If we don't figure out what we want to have happen in that park, uh, the, the events will pass us by. So very happy to see that in there. Um, the, I did want to make a quick note about the horticultural folks. Um, there's no more, I mean, they're basically artists that work with uh, land, the, the land rather than with paint or, you know, other media. Um, they do exceptionally good work. Um, I know they do it with a very small team. I uh, just wanted to note nothing for this year, but um, we probably will need a budget increase there going forward, um, especially if we're going to be getting into more and more uh, alternative stormwater practices and rain gardens and such. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me to build up separate horticultural expertise elsewhere. There's a bureaucratic piece that needs to happen, I think, between um, our infrastructure folks and planning Halifax Water and Parks and Rec to deliver that uh, service effectively. Um, fee review. Did, is there something in the budget for the amount um, for my, uh, like, because I'm assuming there'll be some sort of Incre uh, budgetary impact from doing that because, uh, you know, for my colleagues who are new when this last came before us, I mean, it, it's a political hot potato because a fee review, while it makes sense in the macro, there are winners and losers um, to the process. Uh, is, is, is that built into the budget, some expectations on that? Uh, through you, Chair, to the Councillor, what we've decided, Councillor, is we're going to bring it back in this fiscal year, but for implementation in 22. The reason for that is in order to give groups as much time to uh, absorb any changes and to be able to, because we're always booking, there's always a season starting, we want to come back, determine if council wants to implement or what you want to implement, and then implement that for next fiscal. So that's why you don't see a specific line item for that. Okay, thank you for that. Duly noted for colleagues of difficult decisions to come. Um, but uh, you know, I was enthusiastic and supportive of it last time. So uh, you know, we'll we'll see we'll see what the even bigger bigger picture because now it's no longer <laughs> it's no longer just one. It's the whole thing now. So. Um, the, what about the one HRM membership? I mean, this is something I'm really keen on. I mean, it's to me, it, it makes no sense that you have to buy individual memberships to uh, Sportsplex, Canada Games, Cole Harbor. We would certainly serve our public better. And I think we would actually be a net gain financially if uh, we just had one card, one membership that worked at all facilities, uh, because suddenly it would, make, it would be a more attractive option out there for people. So where are we at in terms of that project? So again, thank you, uh, three chair to the councillor. That we had a number of pieces of, of I would call them um, uh, base work that had to be done. One was the new agreements with the facilities. The next was implementation of technology so that everybody's on the same technology platform. So we've just, uh, well, we have one left, uh, Centennial Pool, which because it's closed for the repairs uh, to get implemented, that will then, essentially be the enabling pieces that we need to then do and determine how best to implement one membership. We're still committed to one membership, but we needed, um, I, I think we probably years past jumped the gun a bit thinking that it was gonna be an easier implementation than okay. it is. So now that we've got the, the basis done, basics done, now we can start to implement um, the governance changes and whatnot that's needed to determine how best to implement one membership. Absolutely great. It doesn't, uh, you, you know, we're one, one um, 
opportunity for recreation. We need to be able to have people move as fluidly through that. So it's just a matter now of now that we've got the, the technology in place is to, to determine what next steps and governance are needed to be able to implement that. So is there a project team working on this uh, this year? <laughs> It, it's will we'll be this year's more be, um, kind of figuring out the plan because many of the people who would need to work on that are still wrapping up some of the other pieces of work. So we uh, we need to start to to get the pro process and the project scoped out, and then we'll start. Uh, I would anticipate that's like a next year business plan item. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I was planning, Mr. Chair, to move the MDF um, amounts for the parking lot. We could do that now, or if uh, you'd like, uh, we could go to the next speaker. That's up to you. You have, uh, yep, go ahead. I'll move it then. I'd like to move the 1.7 uh, million uh, amount for the MDF subsidies to the parking lot. Second, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Councillor Mason, for seconding that. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Rustin. Thank you. Uh, I, I think, uh, colleagues, we all are aware of the impacts that have happened in our facilities as a result of COVID. Um, to me, where we've received, um, I'm forgetting the amount off the top of my head, was it 20 or 40 million that came from the federal and provincial government to help us manage um, restart? Um, to me, it would be fairly disingenuous to be going into when we've received money specifically for this purpose to make sure that we can, you know, reopen um, and reduce impacts to then uh, not be funding the MDFs uh, where they've all seen drops in memberships, where they've all seen losses in rental revenue from not being able to hold um, events and rent out, rent out space. It would be very disingenuous to us to then, for, in my opinion, for us to then turn around and basically mandate cuts in programs and services at our MDFs because because uh, we aren't willing to provide a portion of that uh, money for as a subsidy to them. So uh, I would urge you all to support this. This uh, cuts there is the last thing we need. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, everything Sam just said, and also, uh, you know, practically uh, we have now instituted supporting MDFs and, uh, and recognizing they need to be subsidized but only a couple of years ago, we just let them run deficits every year and then eventually we absorbed it and paid it off. So I feel like this is more an issue of accounting honesty. Are we going to admit there is a chance we may need to spend up to 1.7 million on this or are we going to just pay it out at the back end? Uh, you know, I think the key thing for me is what uh, Ms. Schofield said about how, um, you know, hopefully the recovery is stronger and faster, you know, with the additional uh, uh, 5 million additional uh, vaccines coming into the country this month that was just announced, it could be that we really do have everybody with one shot in their arm uh, in Nova Scotia by the end of June and everything's largely open and mostly back to normal with a little bit more precautions. Uh, in that case, maybe it isn't 1.7 million, but I just don't see how we can do this to these boards and these uh, associations in, in good conscience. Uh, I think we need to be honest that this is a cost we have to bear. So I'll support it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Denise. This is a, one of the questions I had on, on the main motion. So when I look at this, I, I, my question is why do, and you might have mentioned this and I might have just missed it, but why do we have to add it to the parking lot rather than just being absorbed in the, in the main budget, I mean, in your main budget? Thank you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. So the the reason it's in the parking lot is um, one for transparency, but two, if it was absorbed and if we had it absorbed it in our budget, then we would have had to uh, cut other areas. So it's it's really this is as as Councillor Mason mentioned, this is this is the decision that Council made a number of years ago was to have these budgets come forward and all and make decisions on what subsidies you're going to provide. So it is a transparent process. If we had the, the, the 1.5 that you put in last year as an ongoing is in our budget. But if we just, if we absorb this one, you would have had cuts in other areas. Two, you wouldn't have had the transparent explanation as to what it costs to run these facilities in a COVID world. Right, great. So, so then uh, looking at what we put in the last budget for the facilities, is that the previous subsidy um, column? Is that what that, I like that's that's correct. So, okay. so last, so I would describe it a little bit as in normal day to day, 
it costs about 1.5 million over and above what they're able to generate to run those facilities. In a COVID world with increased cost and reduced revenue, there is an added cost and that's an additional 1.7. Next right. year, well, God willing, COVID is behind us all and then we would go back to normal um, times, but uh, this, is, this is the one, this is the year with the additional cost we anticipate because of COVID. Okay, and then the additional net new funds, what does what that category represent? That represents what each individual facility requires. So it's, to, it's to, again, from a transparency point of view to show council which facilities um, require more and which facilities require less. So for instance, Centennial Pool feels that they can operate or their budget, they can operate with the subsidy that they got last year, that they don't need additional costs. Whereas um, the forum, because of the, the reductions they've felt and the added costs they have are requesting uh, 386,000 over um, what, they, what they needed last year, which they, they were able to break even without a subsidy. So it's, it's the, the additional net new is the additional increase for each individual facility. Right, so we're, so we're cause the, the motion has the 1 million seven, um, the requested sub subsidy is 3.2, but because of uh, these are new funds. We're only looking at the the added. Correct. Uh, okay, got you. Correct. All right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to clarify that piece. Uh, so that's it for me, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Denise. I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, to get a clarification. You know, as a new councillor. Um, I don't have the history of some of my other colleagues um, who may have seen these numbers before. Um, and I'm just trying to understand the breadth of the issue uh, when it comes to previous subsidies. So, you know, I know that um, in the community overall with St. Margaret Center, it's integral. Those rinks are so important, uh, you know, to all of the, the groups, um, you know, that, that use those rinks. Uh, certainly this year was definitely challenging. Uh, but when I look at 320,000 as a previous subsidy, I'm trying to understand if this is year over year an issue where the organization is not able um, to financially sustain itself. And also knowing that we don't have Halifax Rec programs in that facility. It's not, you know, um, consistently hearing and Kelly Allen uh, mentioned as well, you know, uh, whether or not we're getting the, the best bang for our buck with this organization. I know that the nonprofit board does great work uh, trying to keep it going, especially in this year, they're, they're to be commended. And I know that they are providing financial reports um, to help uh, you know, keep staff uh, in the loop uh, with how well they're doing or, or you know, where they're struggling, um, especially when it comes to, you know, a new roof or uh, a new liner for the pool and, and different kinds of larger infrastructure costs. But what I'm wondering is uh, where that kind of uh, quantitative data comes in. Uh, so, or sorry, qualitative data, as far as, you know, how well are they communicating to the community to create the programs that the community needs in order to create more revenue? Um, you know, and so I'm just, I'm just wondering where sort of that line of transparency is with uh, some of these NDFs and how we uh, in the community can support these groups better, maybe as fundraising efforts maybe they don't have enough people on their board to help out with uh, community fundraising or uh, programming um, and certainly I haven't been able to get some of the, the those details so while I understand that they're reporting financially I'm also just looking at what, where is the business plan uh, to make sure that we don't continuously give half a million dollars uh, year over year uh, to an organization that could actually be doing better uh, financially to sustain itself. Thanks, Councillor. So, Mr. Chair, forgive me. I'm going to ask for a little latitude and maybe do a little bit of a, a longer explanation that, for, especially for our new councillors, because this is a very complicated topic. So, um, as Councillor Mason mentioned, these facilities have been there. Were, it was a decision 30 plus years ago by the, the previous municipalities that these facilities would be alternate service delivery. So, they are HRM facilities, but run by the community board. And the, the premise of that is the community has. Um, has their finger on the pulse, even more so than HRM can across this entire vast 
municipality on what is what the needs of that particular community are. So they are run by community boards, but they are municipal facilities. So maintenance capital is done by HRM. So if the new roof needs to go on that facility, that actually is in, you would have approved some of those items in the capital budget. And as Councillor Mason mentioned many years ago, and this is the, the how these, these seven got in this, uh, this bucket, so to speak, they, they would run deficits and the HRM would absorb the deficits, but there was no accountability or transparency to council as to how well they were being, their financial was being run. And they were often, many of them were making decisions to break even that weren't necessarily recreation decisions. So we would have private enterprises in these facilities. We'd have other businesses, um, for-profit entities, and they weren't all being used for recreation purposes. In order, for, but but the municipal it, mini, uh, recreation is something that is subsidized. It does not necessarily break even in the municipality. So in those facilities that are my team operates, we don't have to account for in our budget things like electricity, because the way HRM budgets its systems is Jerry Blackwood pays many of our maintenance costs. We don't have to cover. Um, you know, cleaning, those kinds of things. In these particular facilities, they are fully responsible for all costs. And recreation is not necessarily something that does break even. So they do require a subsidy. And, but the change that was done a number of years ago with these new agreements is they now come to council and present their budgets through, through our process, whereby you as council can decide, is this the right, is this good value for money that you're providing to these facilities in order to operate? So. And, and be able to um, know what you're covering. In terms of the business case, so attached to the back of the Parks and Recreation business plan are um, the business plans for each facility. This is a fairly new process. This, I think this is the second time or maybe third year that we've done this. So we tweak it every year to be able to get the right information to, um, to council, the right, right level of information so that you can get a sense in terms of, so. But you're right, we're, we're, we're working with these groups through these agreements to determine what's the right structure of your, of your board governance? How are you meeting HRM requirements? So what, what are you doing to be able to meet HRM programming? So, and as I mentioned in one of my earlier slides, we're now able to, able to report on what programming all of these facilities offer. In the past, we were only able to report on what our parks and rec programming was. But this is the decision that council made a number of years ago that we were going to have these major facilities operated through an alternate service delivery model whereby the community board determines what programming is offered and how it's offered. This is the process to get the, the transparency and the accountability of what they're offering and how they're funded to council. So hopefully that's a little bit of background and context to help with, the, with your consideration of these amounts. Yeah, no, I do appreciate it. I, I did see the uh, the document at the back of the report. I, I, I read through that. I, I, I wouldn't classify that as a business case or a business plan. Um, it, it's very minimalistic as far as not really providing uh, a sense of what the bigger plan is to increase the revenue. But certainly this is a you know, an interesting opportunity to, to raise some of these issues, but I think it's probably best one-on-one uh, -on -one to work with the organization to get a better sense of how we can uh, reduce that subsidy year over year. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Cuddle, you've uh, turned your video on, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know I'm flip flop flip flopping back here on the um, on the chat so because the you know the issue around the MDFs is one that is kind of complex and blurry in some cases. I mean, I'm looking at the list here and I don't see the Prospect Road Community Center on here, even though they're an HRM owned facility which is operated by a community board. And so you know sometimes I. I I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around what is an MDF, what isn't one, how do we support those that don't fall into this bucket, but fall into some bucket that I don't know what bucket they would fall into specifically. Um, but, you know, so, and my other comment is that while we have the MDFs, we also have a large number of community run facilities that have agreements with HRM. Um, you know, these, these, 
you know, sometimes the buildings are owned by the community, sometimes they're owned by HRM, sometimes they've been transferred to the community, um, but they are run by community boards and we do have agreements with them. And they're really, really critical to, com to the communities in which they are part of. I mean, they provide recreation programming, they provide community facilities like meeting rooms and community space. They often run daycares out of them or seniors programming. Um, you know, in the case of the Lions Rink Arena here in Spryfield, they, they run an entire arena. Um, and, and I just want to give a shout out to the Lions Rink because they did an amazing job over the past year um, responding to COVID and working to find ways to continue to provide recreational activities, um, as well as things like COVID testing, pop-up sites, and more. But um, but I just want to comment that at the best of times, there's a real inconsistency in the level of service delivery amongst these community-run facilities. And um, you know, with COVID, we've seen this even more. Um, you know, they're, you know, they are volunteer community board run um, with then, you know, community volunteer community boards, they have different levels of capacity and ability. Um, some are doing well, some are not. Um, so I'm just wondering in this budget, if it's not under the MDF budget, like where in the budget is something for places like the Prospect Road Community Center or other community run facilities that have some kind of agreement with HRM. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in how we support them in adapting and recovering to the COVID situation, because a lot of them have cut services and they haven't been able to bring them back. And I just, you know, think that these are so important to, you know, the health and well-being of um, communities all across HRM. You note in the in the report that there's a hundred, we have over 150, 150 of these kind of facilities. Um, you know, so yeah, they're really, really important for social interaction, cultural appreciation, you know, emergency response, com building community resiliency, um, among other things. So I'm just um, wondering if you can speak a little bit about. If they don't fit under the MDF, where do they fit and how are they being funded? And that one question specifically about the Prospect Road Community Center. Sure, Councillors, thank you. Just threw the chair to you. So you're right. So it's not 150 facilities run by these. We've got over 30 partnership facilities. So the seven that are called considered MDFs, that's specifically from direct previous direction of council. And as I said in one of the slides, the primary reason to focus on that was, as, as Councillor Mason mentioned, there was large deficits, but also the programming is about 70%, based on value, is about 70% of the overall cost. But you're absolutely right. So we have all of these other groups have, um, have uh, agreements with the municipality. Prospect is not considered a multi-district facility because that's very specific to these seven that Council directed us to do a review. What we are doing with all of these other facilities is we're modernizing their agreements. There is funding that's provided. In one of my earlier slides, it was something like, uh, it was 2.1 million. So some of that, about 1.5 last year went to MDFs. The rest of that is going to um, all of these other facilities. So we have funding in Maggie McDonald's budget that is, you'll hear people talk about the contribution fund, emergency fund, that kind of thing that is provided. All of those groups in their agreements have funding that they receive from HRM to help support their operation. And similar to these ones, when we own the buildings, we're responsible for the capital maintenance of those buildings. So um, it's, not, it's, it's not specifically laid out like these seven that were specific for that project or that direction from council, but we're working through those other ones to update those agreements now that we've gotten the big ones out of the way and coming back, you'll see every year we bring two or three of them back where we modernize and negotiate the new agreements with the small um, community facilities, but they that all of that funding is embedded in, um, in our cost centers under Maggie's team. And is there COVID support? Um, yes. So this year, as I mentioned, we, get, we provided additional funding because everything from the, you know, they had to buy, you know, plexiglass and additional uh, personal protective gear and wipes. And so HRM helped provide some funding to help offset some of those costs because to your point, you know, this, this was hit upon us. We, 
they, they don't have unlimited ability to raise money and they, they're often operating on a shoestring. But the, the, the model, this alternate service delivery model is one that council has supported for, like I say, over 30 years. And, and you've, you've reviewed the model a couple of different times as to whether you wanted to continue with this model or start to adapt it to a different approach. But it, there has been very clear direction to the staff that this community um, board-based model and having the community boards run these facilities is the model that you, uh, wanted to continue with. Okay, and just how much money has been, I'm just trying to find where where in the budget that is. It, it was in, we, what we could do with, with free council, because it's in an account called C705, but on slide, on slide, give me for a second, slide what? Fourteen, we spell out that the amount of funding last year to facilitate uh, all of these facilities. These are our partner facilities. Was two point four eight nine million. So that's you know small that amounts. Includes, of stuff. Pardon me. That includes the that includes the MDS. That includes the one point five that was provided to the MDS. Um. Can I? I would like a little more information about that to see it broken down. Can I request a briefing note on that? Or what would I request better? I just really want to understand better how they're being financially supported. Would sure. I ask? I mean, that's, that's internal, entirely. If, if the committee budget committee wants to request a, a briefing note on, you know, breakdown of that money, that's uh, certainly in your, in your purview to, if you wanted to, uh, to get that as part of this. Okay, and do I need to make a motion for that, Mr. Chair? Unless Denise would uh, like to provide that uh, without a motion. Uh, yes, it would be helpful to make a motion uh, for that. We, we, can, we can provide it directly to the council, but I think for transparency, it's better if we provide it just through a motion back to, to the budget committee. Absolutely. I would like that as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I, I believe we can do that. Um, we are now a motion within a motion. Uh, and so we would be talking about the briefing note to come back. It could come back as part of this motion. I'm not sure. And I would look to either uh, Mr. Fraser or Mr. McLean to uh, confirm whether or not we can do this. Or do we have to decide on this motion before we entertain the motion on the briefing note about the other facilities? Chair, I think you can send it to the parking lot with a briefing note as well, request. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I think the parking lot might be the easiest approach. I would second that. Okay. Thank you. So we are looking to add a, uh, a briefing note on the remaining facilities. Is that what you're looking for, Councillor Cuddle? Um, I, I I, I don't even know what to call them, Mr. Chair. Are they the community partner facilities? I, yeah, they... I, would, I would think it's a briefing note, Mr. Chair, on the funding provided to all of our partner facilities. Okay. A bit of Thank a break, breakdown of that. I think that's probably what, is, is that close to what you're thinking, Councillor? Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Councillor Lovelace has seconded that. Um, so do we have any speakers on the briefing note related to the uh, partner facilities? Go ahead, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cuddle, for bringing this forward. It's something that, uh, that we're seeing in District 13 as well, a real disparity uh, between facilities, uh, you know, ones that are on property that they uh, used to be owned by HRM, that they now own themselves and are struggling uh, with uh, high insurance costs, whereas other facilities that are delivering programs, uh, you know, to the community are not struggling because they're on HRM property. Uh, but also there are groups that are paying out of their own pocket to put in new windows and to do roofing repairs and uh, on HRM facilities. So I think looking at this 2.5 million, breaking it down, looking at the facility agreements would help us, uh, you know, understand a little bit better how, uh, how things are actually working on the ground in our districts, and also ways that we can uh, potentially provide better support and more equitable support. So thank you, Councillor Cuddle, and thank you, Denise, for, for, uh, for assisting us. Thank you. 
Uh, are there any further speakers on the briefing note related to the facility agreements? Okay. In that case, I would uh, call for the question and, and ask for the clerk to run through the roll, please. And we have the motion in the chat now that the budget committee request a briefing note on, on the funding supports provided to HRM partner recreation facilities. That is the motion that we are voting on right now. Beginning with district 16, Deputy Mayor Otit. Voting yes, thank you. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor as well. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. Chair Russell. In favor. And Mayor Savage. In favor. Great, thank you. Uh, that motion passes. We are now back on the other motion that the budget committee requests a briefing note detailing the measures and implications for including uh, 1.757350 million uh, in one-time funding for costs associated with the multi-district facility subsidy request COVID impact within the proposed 2021-22 Parks and Recreation budget to be considered in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. There are no further speakers on That's that. True. The question has been called. So over to the clerk to run through the roll on that motion. Beginning with District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Councilor Cleary. Ten, Councilor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, <laughs> Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. Fifteen, Chair Russell. In favor. Sixteen, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. Councilor Cleary. Okay, that, that motion passes. Um, so at this point it is a uh, quarter after 12 and we, I think should break for lunch uh, and I expect everybody would agree. Uh, so can we return at quarter after one? So we would return at 1.15. Uh, over to the clerk, uh, I believe it's the same meeting. Yes, everyone will return to this Zoom link. And as a reminder, when you return to the meeting, your microphones will be shut off as we will be returning live into the YouTube link. We will turn on once we have quorum and everybody is in attendance. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great lunch.
Mr. Chair, you all should have your audio and video settings returned to you, and we are ready on your call. Mr. Chair, awesome. it's Jane. Can you hear my audio at all? Yes, we can. You're coming through clearly. Lovely. Thank you. It is 1.15, uh, let's resume. Thank you very much and welcome back uh, to the afternoon session of the Budget Committee for March 31st, where we're talking about the Parks and Rec budget. I'm continuing with the speakers list uh, that we had this morning and Councillor Cuddle, uh, if you are with us, then uh, please go ahead. Well, um, I'm, am I back on the speaking list? You are, you are at the top of the speaking list. All right, that was, I addressed that question in the uh, previous. Okay, So that's that, wonderful. That was the flip-flopping there. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. There we go, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Denise, for uh, the uh, the presentation. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that I'm going to be able to uh, put on my resume is the fact that I was deputy mayor during a pandemic. And one of the things that uh, that you know that allowed me to do was sit in on the daily phone calls, conference calls that we had with all of the uh, business unit directors and um, all of the words that have been said about Denise and her team. Uh, you know, I, I just, I can't top any of it because I watched firsthand how, you know, steady, calm and rational that she was in situations where things were changing on a you know, I being saying it, changing on a daily basis would be underestimating because things were changing on an hourly basis. So, uh, you know, as uh, as reluctant as Denise is to uh, take the uh, the bouquet that's been uh, handed to her, uh, please, please do because it was your uh, your steady hand that really saw that uh, that group through some uh, really tough times. So uh, thank you again on behalf of the, uh, the residents of uh, District 14. I just, so have, uh, I just have uh, you know, a quick uh, question about um, ball fields. And I know this is a challenge every year. And I'm just wondering if any changes are proposed for ball field maintenance with this new budget, because I know that this has been a bit of a, an issue for uh, weekend ball tournaments in particular, where the grooming schedules for the fields fall on a Friday and a Monday. All the action takes place Saturday, Sunday. Uh, and just wondering if any changes are proposed, uh, thoughts about moving to uh, you know, a seven day a week cycle, six days a week cycle, uh, that sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councilor. Thank you very much for your kind words. It really does mean a lot and again, the team, you know, our, our staff are incredible and I really do appreciate the recognition um, as well. In terms of ball fields, uh, yes, I, what I would say in that is that prior to COVID, Council had approved some additional seasonal staff for our budget, which we never got to uh, take advantage of because we had to do all the cuts because of COVID. So those positions, this will be the first year that you actually, uh, we actually have those on the ground and uh, are able to deploy them. I will ask Ray if he has any specific details on the on ball fields, but that was part of what council um, approved last year was to give us some additional seasonal staff specifically for changing to a bit of a seven day a week cycle and being able to to manage um, the, the maintenance on our fields in a better way. So Ray, I'm not sure if you can add a bit more to that. Uh, just trying to open my camera up here. <clears throat> there we go. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we will be adding some additional staff uh, for the weekend, particularly for field maintenance. Um, we'll be working closely with our booking and scheduling team, as well as the users of the field to determine schedules so that we can uh, approach uh, fields in between games and, and uh, especially on tournaments um, to do some uh, tidy up of the infield and litter and, and things of that nature. So in some, yes, to answer your question, we will have some weekend service uh, for fields this coming season. Thank you. Great news. Thank you very much, Ray. Thank you, Denise. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks so much for this opportunity to speak to your presentation. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, as a new councillor, it's really helpful to go through, uh, you know, these with a fine tooth comb to fully understand the inner workings <laughs> of this huge department that does such incredible, incredible work, you know, for the health and wellness uh, of citizens, um, for tourists, uh, and, and, and as a, you know, an economic tool, really, for our, our communities. Um, and the integration uh, with the tourism development is so important. Uh, and so on that note, uh, one of the things that uh, I've been struggling with and, and residents have been struggling with is the public awareness of assets and understanding you know, what we have, where we have it and, and what it is. And part of that, of course, is um, you know, the GIS uh, tool, which we have, which is great. Um, and kudos to your staff. I'm so happy with the changes, you know, on a dime that they've been able to make when we recognize, well, that isn't the right name uh, of the park, or that's not, you know, really what the asset is, or, you know, just, just being able to really focus on uh, looking at all of the variety that we have. And so I'm curious about the public awareness of the assets and how we can do a little bit better to help communities know what they have in their communities. And also recognize that uh, though we have a public park in a subdivision, it's not owned by the subdivision. So, uh, you know, neighboring folks or visiting folks can certainly come and, and, and use those facilities. Um, the other question that I have is around, um, you know, how we create complete uh, facilities or complete parks. Um, and so obviously one of those issues is ensuring that we have accessibility play structures, uh, that we're working with the community to create these play structures, uh, whether it's a sport field or, you know, adding to a bike park, um, and how we can create uh, complete parks that are for everyone. Uh, and I'll just use the example of Tomahawk Park in Hammonds Plains as an example, where the community was, you know, community rate pairs groups putting money in, we're doing uh, a great partnership, but when it comes to uh, adding something that, you know, the younger family members uh, could use while the older family members, you know, the older kids are, are playing on the sport field, um, the uh, problem was that, oh, well, no, we're not going to add a play structure here because it's actually too close uh, within the vicinity of another play structure. Uh, but as a parent, you know, you've got three kids, um, you're not going to be running back and forth from one play structure to the other. And so I'm just wondering if we can kind of change our thinking around what a complete park looks like and uh, how we can actually add value for the families that are using that park and thinking about all of the users, not just one sort of user group, uh, you know, or one age group. Um, and the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is the Glenhaven Park, and I know I'm going to run out of time here soon, uh, but the Glen, Glenhaven Park and looking along Peggy's Cove Road, we have very limited uh, open spaces or park structures overall. Yes, we've got Peggy's Cove. That's a provincial entity. It's beautiful and lovely. Um, but And we've got East St. Margaret School, which has uh, had a few upgrades. Uh, but the sale of the Glenhaven Community Park and Community Center, uh, I think, was it, you know was to the detriment overall for the community. We've got growing community in Glenhaven, um, more residential activity happening there, and uh, I, I really think that you know maybe it's that rural recreational strategy that's going to help us identify the gaps uh, that we're not delivering to the community. And I hope that you know when we do sell these structures uh, or these public facilities that there's a broader community outreach um, because uh, it, it, from what I'm hearing, the community was blindsided and didn't know that that community hall was no longer you know, available to the community. Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So 
I think I caught all of that, Councillor. So in, in terms of public awareness of assets, you're right. So right now we, we're, as, as you know, and you've been helping us out, we're updating the asset registry, relatively kind of new process that's going through. And I think for the new councillors, one of the pieces of information that I will share, not to, um, for, for context, is that Parks and Rec is actually a relatively new department. We're only about five years old. So we used to have a recreation department, but parks used to be embedded in uh, streets and roads. So we are readily acknowledge we have a lot of work to do and we're, and we're playing catch up because we're now having a focus on parks more so than we had in many other years just because of organizational structure. So we are working through the assets to update them. At the same time, we are implementing, you know, social media can be a challenge. It can also be a huge benefit to get information out to the residents about what parks or what assets or what types of programming and whatnot is in the community. So we're doing um, a bunch of different components to try and get people aware of what may be in their backyard that they're not necessarily aware of. Uh, so that's a, a lot of kind of focus that the team has been doing over the last little bit, ensuring that we know what our assets are, what where they are, proper nameage, all of that, as well as getting people aware of what we have. In terms of park, what, so what you're describing in terms of complete parks and what's in a park, that's a lot, that's, that's what we call park standards. So as I mentioned in my presentation, that's one of the things that will, is in our business plan to, to undertake some work on park standards this year. I will say we have, depending on the type of park, so a park that's a regional park has certain criteria of things that are in it. Parks that are neighborhood, absolutely, parks are public spaces, they're available to any Body, whether it's a resident, whether it's a visitor, one neighborhood to another, but there are parks, depending on the standard and the size and whatnot, that are more focused on certain areas or certain uses than others. But the park standard work that we're doing is to help us determine things like how far away, to your point, how far should, should playgrounds be from each other so that you get um, good coverage, not too much coverage, not too little coverage. So that's some work that we are undertaking. Um, it's in our budget, our business plan to undertake this year. Uh, <clears throat> rural, rural recreation strategy, absolutely, Councillor. You're a little bit that we've had been able to talk about to you about that. And uh, I, I, my team was telling me on the lunch break that uh, the survey is now out for that. So any any uh, uh, communication you can give to your residents. To, we want as many people um, providing us feedback on that as possible. But you're right, there's different, we're, we're anticipating hearing different needs, expectations, because people recreate differently in a rural area where they, um, assets may be further apart, they have to drive, uh, or there's interest in other activities. So that is all part of that. I think that rural recreation strategy is gonna certainly give us a lot of insight to help us um, navigate forward how we plan and implement and develop not just parks but also recreation assets in our more rural areas and how best to meet the needs that people are expecting us to meet in those areas. Um, the Glenhaven Park situation, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on that one, Councillor, so I believe if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly that's a specific facility that was sold to a community group so that process is through council. If there is a, a request to purchase a piece of municipal parkland, it's, it's an administrative order 50. It's a process that whereby real estate brings a list of potential um, parcels to sell to council for, and in cases of what we would call community stream, which are below market value sales, there's a public hearing component to that. So there is a process so that we, so that we can try and have um, as much knowledge in the community so that people don't get blindsided by a potential sale. But that is a, uh, I know that it's a, it's a, a, also a relatively new process that real estate has implemented a number of years ago. They implemented this AO50. Um, we haven't had a whole lot, but there it is. So it's a bit of a learning curve for everybody on what that process is. But it, it, there is a, um, a component of that it comes to council to ensure that there isn't something sold or um, disposed of that has a definite public community need. There may be interest in the community in having an asset, but right. the, the local councillor or the community may feel that there's a broader community need that it remain in public ownership. 
And I think that's the problem is that it's owned now by a private business. And so that's where, you know, the community is wondering, how did we lose this public asset? So I'll continue to dig into that with, with staff. But I would suggest that each district uh, have an asset map, uh, you know, as a starting point, is especially with this survey, so they can understand, you know, have a look at where those assets are. Uh, and as they're answering the survey, survey to have a better context in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mason. There we go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, staff. Uh, you know, just to, uh, ditto to everything everybody said, Denise, about how great your team has been uh, during an extremely stressful time for all. Uh, moving into most of the things that I, I wanted to speak about, I've been uh, already done through. Uh, motions put forward by other folks. I had a couple of questions though, and I'll just give them all to you at once and I'll try and be very brief and then hand it over to you, Denise. The, the first is, I saw this in the other uh, business units, but I thought uh, maybe there aren't comparables, but what I'm, what's really striking me right now with Parks and Rec is that the uh, the MBA, the, the, the federal or the, the national comparators are not in the budget for, for any of the business units, I guess, but but particularly for well, call from Newfoundland, I wonder what that is, uh, 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 particularly for parks, right? Because without having any of those comparators there, the internally generated ones or the ones from the, from the association, the, especially our new councillors, but, but all councillors are not reminded that in the past, when we've looked at this, we're funding parks and rec to about 50% or half of the national average. And so one of the reasons as simple as, you know, simply put why uh, you hear from your residents, how come the fields in Bridgewater or Truro are always so nice is they have fewer fields and they're paying more money per person to do it, right? It's a per capita amount. So, you know, changing our asset mix doesn't matter. We're not spending as much as other municipalities per capita on parks and rec, and that creates a service gap and it creates a problem where people's expectations are often uh, coming from other adjacent municipalities or they've come here from, from the rest of the country. So I'm wondering, maybe the CFO or, or yourself could speak to that. Like the, uh, those national comparators to me were very, you know, as flawed as they were, were very important. Uh, second is on the operating under budget lines you know, I don't really support any of them, I don't think, because I think, you know, you, when you say we could cut the Discovery Center, I imagine they're still there, still have staff, still have heat, still have power. Uh, and then professional arts grants, people are still making art. All of those associations are struggling to survive, as evidenced by Neptune coming forward and asking for a one-time grant. Uh, so, uh, and obviously, uh, uh, hiring students is, is part of the economic recovery as well. I, I think a lot of young people are really counting on that so they don't keep going farther into debt. So, so I'm interested, the Discovery Center, that would be cutting their full amount. There's been no discussion with them. That would be us going to, 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 to just move on that. And then on the over budget on the next page, the, uh, I'm not inclined to move on any of the pending staff reports right now uh, because they're pending and uh, there's lots of stuff uh, at play. I'll say now, and I've said it before, uh, you know, I'm not inclined to vote yes for the art gallery until we start hearing back on some uh, reciprocal uh, asks around the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center and the Turret Society's plan for 1588 Barrington Street. I, we have uh, been first mover in a couple of critical projects in arts and in the First Nations space that, uh, and we're waiting now for over, you know, years, we're waiting for the province to, to come forward. And, and I know their processes are slow, but it would be really hard for me to justify committing funding to any of those until we hear back on, on where they stand on, on the things that we have already led on. Uh, and then, and so the only one that's on that over list uh, that, uh, I think that I think that sums it up. I think I can wait on the Queen's uh, mark piece too. I mean, I, where, where, I guess the question for that is where did we leave that? That's the only one in the uh, service impact piece. Uh, we sent that away. Uh, was it for consideration in a future budget? Was it for a staff report? Like, I know that we discussed it, but I don't remember what we actually decided at this point. It was so long ago, pre-COVID. So those are my questions are the national comparators, uh, has there been any discussion on the over, uh, overs with any of those, with the unders with any of those people? And uh, and where did we leave the uh, public art piece? Thank you. Sure, Councilor. Uh, so I'll, I'll speak briefly on comparators. I, I believe 
Ms. Frazier can also provide some context. You're absolutely right, Councillor. The for for Parks and Rec, while the municipality is no longer um, using MBN, it, it really did show a really interesting picture for Parks and Rec. And without it, there, there is a bit of a gap of information. It was challenging though, because it wasn't a complete picture either. So I know there's lots of reasons why we've moved away from MBN. In terms of under uh, Discovery Center is aware as they are every year that that's an option for council, but you're absolutely right. It was, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're struggling as, as much as anybody else. <laughs> and to your point where Parks and Rec is not um, funded as much as some other cities, it is challenging. Everything we do is valuable. So it's very difficult for us to put forward any or unders that are not paying. When you're already 50% underfunded by the national average by one measure so, that may not be complete, right? So all of them that are, you know, there, there are, they are there because council has the option. They're all hard to do, right? They're not, there's nothing there that is uh, uh, an easy selection, but that is, you know, it's important that we give you options. Um, the over, so the Queens mark where you left that actually, believe it or not, even though it feels like forever ago, the report actually was in the middle of COVID. So we have brought the report to council. You have deliberated on it and you have directed that it be considered as part of this budget. So that's why it's on that over list. So you didn't decide to do it. You decided basically to move it to this deliberation. So if you want to provide that funding, this either it's this year or, you know, you could, I suppose, maybe put it off another year. But this is this is the timeline um, that you directed it be considered under this particular budget. So that would be that would be the piece there, and I'm not. I believe I covered them all. So I'm not sure if Jane, if you want to add anything to MBN. Uh, thank you, Denise, Mr. Chair, through you to the uh, to the councillors. So the decision to uh, move away from MBN Canada as um, a reporting uh, or benchmark was part of the 1920 budget to take in, uh, effect in 2021. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the reason for that is that the amount of work that was involved to manipulate our data to report back really wasn't worth the value that we were getting back. So, so the, the benchmarks really weren't based on, on science or a sound methodology. It was a bunch of, of you know, people in the, in the business that would say, how do, you, how do you measure? How do you measure? And then they would just take a, clump, uh, a group of things and, and do it that way. So it wasn't really, um, it wasn't transferable across uh, other jurisdictions. They are changing their methodology now to, to become more, um, uh, uh, a more scientific approach, we use more uh, analytics. So, so we've said that, you know, we'll, we'll have another look at, at that. Um, we actually had to hire a single a one person to convert all the data in accounting to, just to be able to respond. Um, so that's the reason for that. We are looking at KPIs through some of the work in Wendy Line Shop through corporate uh, planning with SAP coming on with the ability to, to leverage data and do things like that. We will have the ability to, to measure um, and to gather that information and then and to look at other comparable uh, uh, measurements with, with other jurisdictions. Uh, it's great that we can measure ourselves, but we need to benchmark it against, uh, against other uh, industries. So that really was the rationale uh, behind the movement away from MBN Canada. Okay, I'll, uh, I, I look forward to hearing what council has to say about the public art piece and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hensby may have had to step away to another meeting. Uh, are you with us? Okay, I don't see Councillor Hens. I'm still in that other meeting. Okay, we will come back to you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and, you know, I'll echo the previous comments of all of our, our members about all the work that's been done with uh, your staff and, and you uh, in particular, but again, you know, the staff and the ones that are on the front line that, that were able to shift on a dime. We all Appreciate them. I, I remember, I can't remember exactly what we were speaking about, but we were on the phone talking about the many issues that we talk about. And uh, while you were on that call, you got the email that something changed. And what we were talking about at that time, <laughs> you had, well, forget everything we just talked about, because now we got to 
talk, talk about something different. Um, so, it, was you know, being, beaches, it was the budget last year in June to cut some staff for beaches when they reopened beaches. Right, there you go. So so and, and this is this is why we keep you around because you got a, a great memory as well. So you know, just the, just you know, understanding how quickly things change and how quickly our, our staff uh, was able to adapt is amazing. So you know, again, always appreciate the work that everyone does in Parks and Rec. So some of the things, as mentioned, have been already addressed. I did want to talk a little bit more about the universal access. Sam hit on that piece. Um, I know, um, and, and you, you talked about some of the work that's being done. I'm curious on the, the the pieces that are related to outside of HRM facilities. So obviously our MDFs, but also, you know, we've supported the YMCA and they said that they want to be part of that program and other facilities that operate like the YMCA. Just curious on on that aspect of the the, the program. I, and I think it's is it called Universal Access Program? Is that what we were calling it? No. It's one membership. One membership. Okay. One membership program, yeah. Um, the other question I had is just an update on the common master plan. I know there's some folks who are just wondering, um, the public wondering what's happening with that. Um, again, related to, I, I'm going to say it was legend, but thinking of when we, when we shifted to opening one of our busiest uh, facilities, which is the Oval, uh, which uh, on, in the report here, we see 100,000 plus uh, members of the public use that. Uh, I'm wondering two things, thinking of the system, because there were some hiccups at the beginning, obviously probably because of the, the demand that was needed. What did we learn? Um, what, uh, what, what services or resources might, might, we need, what might we need for that? And maybe because of COVID uh, in the influx, the system wasn't ready for it. Um, and that would be different than a usual situation. So I'm just curious on with the, you know, particularly oval, but overall, did the system do what we wanted to do when, when we uh, put it online? And uh, yeah, that, that's it. Everything else has been addressed uh, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mr. Chair, for your counselor. Um, thanks, counselor, great question. So the, yeah, the one membership, we we are talking in, in in your district in particular. We are talking with the Y about kind of future plans because we we have facilities right across from each other and how can we partner better. We would look to do kind of expanding that one membership more. But what we really our initial focus is on HRM. We've also had some of those facil other facilities, whether it's some of the privately owned rinks. They've also expressed an interest in exploring whether they should look at legend as well so that residents have one stop that it doesn't matter necessarily if it's a privately owned facility or if it's an hrm owned facility that they can go to one place so it's definitely future plans but certainly at this point our focus is on getting um, the hrm owned ones up and, and all of the functionality in place as well as uh, figuring out how to do that one membership for our owned facilities once we once we kind of learn learn how to do that, I think it's going to help inform us as to how we could expand beyond the common master plan. So as I said, we were we were getting close to wrapping that up when COVID hit, and then that, as you um, said, basically changed everything that we did. We are now back on track to finalize that. We're we're looking to try and get that back to council in the first quarter of of the of the, this fiscal, so that. Uh, um, you can make decisions on that, and then, and then, um, we'll, you know, we can implement that that uh, guiding document for any future decisions on the common. Uh, great question about the oval and legend and what we learned. So, uh, what I would say about the oval is the oval was never intended to be a booked facility. It's it's the epitome of our of our unstructured play, where you just spontaneously show up, and you know, participate for as long as you want. COVID changed all of that. We weren't allowed to just let people stop in places. We had to do contract tracing, which meant we had to book people and, and all of that. So uh, what we would do in the future, well, hopefully we don't have to do that in the future. Um, lessons that we did learn. So I think we were adapting it as we went, as we were able, or as we got permission to have more people on the oval, we were adding people. We the, Probably the biggest thing that we learned was to adjust the booking time so that people could um, so that everybody wasn't trying to book up once and, and it spaced out the uh, bookings. Once we changed to that, it certainly gave, and, and we're able to add more or place, places, 
it certainly gave much more um, flexibility for people. I guess what I would say is, you know, at any given time during the uh, the busy winter, especially on the weekend, we could have over a thousand, close to two thousand people at the Oval and on the Plaza. With COVID, when we were stuck at like 150, 250, 300, that was, you know, really challenging. We we were maxed out at the number and the amount of time, so we set we set we did consider whether we would expand to longer skates with try and get more people on longer times but the the one hour skates um tends to be the you know people don't tend to stay much more than an hour so that uh, that amount of time seemed to work but we're really hopeful that you know covid will be pretty much behind us next year we won't have to do, remove that spontaneity because that really is what um was was so challenging for people is that they they couldn't get a space and they couldn't go just whenever they wanted so that's the the, the system did legend we had to adapt some things in legend because legend was never intended to be um, a contract tracing um, software and that kind of thing we were able to we I, ca I can tell you we were very thankful that we had that software in place uh, when COVID hit because things like we could refund people's credit cards whereas in the past under the old system we would have had to issue them checks and we were you know we refunded several um you know a a couple of million dollars so that's a lot of checks to cut that's a lot of, of work for jane's staff that's a lot of paper to be issued and whatnot so the system the technology that we had certainly allowed us to do contract tracing much more efficiently refund much quicker um so we were adapting the software to meet the uh, the public health restrictions it, it um it wasn't built that way but we were certainly adapting it and uh, it certainly helped us get through covid in a little bit easier way than we would have had we had had that and had to do everything manually. So, um, but but we're really hopeful that next next winter for the Oval we won't even have to do that much. But we'll see how COVID plays out. Thank you, Chair. How am I am I over time? You're at seven and a half minutes. All right. So I'll I'll, I'll come back. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Denise. What what a big department you have. <laughs> and, um, you know, I also echo everyone's comments about how resilient Parks and Rec and your staff have been during COVID. Um, I must give a shout out. Everybody does know that I am um, shocked that your staff answer us in the evenings. You know, sometimes as a counselor, you're doing work during the day and your emails are in the evening and your staff are answering in the evening. They're actually going to <clears throat> this weekend. Somebody went to check out a, a playground for me on Sunday. So, I mean, it's just, it's incredible how dedicated the staff team are and how much they work. So just kudos to everybody and thank you. You have our undying gratitude. Um, so of course it's no surprise that I'm very, very curious about the playing field strategy. And, um, but one of the things that I'm getting a little concerned about is, and I don't know how you manage it. Well, except probably beautifully. There are so many strategies that get interconnected and interdependent how how do you prioritize and you know, so with the rural rec recreation strategy will that hold up playing field strategy and then when you're looking at rural recreation does it cover sub suburban areas as well as rural what is that boundary again because in every conversation i am learning that the, the different service boundaries change depending on the business unit that you're dealing with so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that I'll, I'll get more proficient at understanding that and I won't have to ask that question anymore. But yeah, so I'm, I'm just worried about that. And then um, the other thing is that interconnected with other business departments, business units, like, for example, our experience with the McDonald's Sports Park, you know, where we're waiting for real properties to negotiate the lease agreement so that we can get that finished and get lights on a ball field and used a whole bunch more. So. I guess maybe I'm not sure that there's a definitive question in no, there. No, I, I'll, I'll give you some context. So you're absolutely right, Councilor. A lot of what we do, um, both internally into internally in Parks and Rec, has all of our divisions work really closely together because there's so many pieces that that overlap. And we are probably one of the business units that works closest with almost every other business unit because so much of what we do um, is impacted or other services are provided by. TPW or community or, or CCS, that kind of thing. So um, in terms of the prioritization and the integration, 
So like I say, the team works to integrate all of those strategies. The prioritization was set in terms of which strategy we, we do when. Uh, a number of years ago when we brought the update to the community facility master plan, there's I think something like 50 some recommendations in that. And those we categorized in short-term, medium-term and long-term recommendations. And council went through that and um, approved essentially not necessarily specific years that we would do those those pieces of work, but in which order we would do those pieces of work. So the playing field strategy is, is underway now. We had, I can I can uh, share with council, we, we just uh, got the, the data from the online surveys. We had over 2,500 survey responses, which is, which is great. Um, the rural recreation strategy, that survey just launched, I understand, today. So the one won't hold up the other, but we're always, the team is always working to make sure that we're that we're ensuring that they align effectively and, and, and don't don't overlap, but we also don't leave gaps. So they one won't hold up the other. Um, in terms of um, the integration, yeah. So much of what we do is is so interconnected. So our team does spend quite a bit of time just making sure that we get that integration right and that that we have. Um, work, our working groups on these files often have people from other business units as well as across the divisions in parks and recreation so that we can ensure we don't, um, th that we have that integration and that we don't leave big gaps outstanding. Uh, Mr. Chair, a follow-up question, if I may? Absolutely, you have almost a minute. Oh, great. In terms of the um, rural recreation strategy, the survey that went out, it's, if it's online, how do we get to those communities that are internet deserts, especially if it's rural and we don't have internet? Um, how do we get that information so that we get their um, responses as well? Sure. Now, uh, on that one, I'm, I'm going to do a call a friend. I'm going to ask Angela Green to, there's a, there's a whole communication strategy. So the, the survey is just one component of it. I'll ask Angela to give a little bit of an overview or a, a brief update on some of the other pieces of communication. I know we we're talk, going to be working with, you know, council newsletters, that kind of thing. But Angela is much more versed in the details of what the, of how they're doing that. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to the councillor. So with the rural recreation strategy, we certainly understand that communicating to people in rural areas is a bit more challenging with that limited access to internet. So we are working um, at doing different uh, different initiatives. So putting posters up in the local convenience store, the bank, pharmacy, um, with links or um, uh, ways to connect to that survey will be part of that. We're also looking at uh, having paper copies available through community groups that are in each of the communities. So we're reaching out through our community developers and through our community recreation coordinators who have the fingers on the pulse of the people in that community to get the surveys out, whether it's through social media, through the website, through paper copies, uh, just getting the, the message out. And we've been working with corporate communications to come up with uh, a plan. And we're also hoping that through the councillor newsletters that we'll be able to get the message out that way as well. And we're also um, looking at uh, through the local newspapers. So the, uh, the, the community newspapers that are out there, uh, working with them to post uh, information about the survey so that we can put our, 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 get information from as many people as possible. And with any luck, as we move forward through the community engagement piece, we're hopefully we'll be able to uh, do a little, some facilitated one-on-one -on -one, uh, managed uh, uh, consultation as well. But that obviously would have, uh, uh, we'd have to follow the public health uh, restrictions around that. So we're trying to do as much as we can through, through the survey, through paper, through newspapers, through council newsletters um, in that way. So we do have a plan in place to reach as many people as we can. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I wasn't sure if I heard someone else continuing or not. Uh, I'm going to step out of the chair for a couple of minutes. Uh, I do have a couple of things that I'm wondering about. And I'm going to start by echoing what everybody else has said. Uh, the Department of Fun and Games. Uh, during uh, during COVID has been absolutely phenomenal. When we were told to shut everything down, 
everything stayed shut down and, and, and Parks and Rec uh, got out there and did a, a masterful job of making sure that things were secure. As things got opened back up, it started with Parks when the Premier said, uh, go out and go for a walk and be somewhere, but don't have anybody around. People all over the place were enjoying the parks, and so the parks were reopened and maintained uh, early on, while everything else was still in some sort of state of closure, or we we weren't sure what at the time or what was coming. And Denise, you and your team, uh, and I could name some individuals, but I wouldn't be doing everybody justice. So rather than leave everybody, rather than leave somebody out, um, you get the lion's share of it. Sorry, uh, it. Uh, Thank you very much for absolutely everything uh, that you and your team have done. It was absolutely phenomenal, and, and I appreciate it uh, ongoing. Um, the one membership model, uh, there has been discussion about that, uh, and, and predominantly in relation to MBFs. And I'm wondering if that, we have a, a bit of an odd duck here in Lower Sackville with the Sackville Sports Stadium in that it's sort of like an MBF, but not, in that uh, it is the one facility of that capacity uh, that HRM owns, the difference is HRM operates it. And so I'm wondering if that would be included in the one membership model, um, how many of those 30 uh, uh, facilities that uh, you had previously mentioned might be included? What is What do we need to move forward with this type of uh, implementation? And just any of the details around that. If you can provide that here, that would be great. If not, uh, would it be better for us to talk offline about that? That is thing one. The thing two is the over pending staff reports. I just wanna make sure I have an understanding of what that means. Uh, as I see it, we have three items where a staff report is coming and there is an ask for money associated with it. I know what two of them are. I, I know what the third one is as well. Uh, and, and uh, um, just wondering if we don't approve the money at this point, uh, where will the money come from for those things? And obviously very interested in the, uh, in the multi-service uh, youth, uh, youth center. Um, and knowing that the report should be coming very shortly uh, for that one, but just wondering if you could address those. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chan. Th again, thank you. I feel like I'm a broken record. Thank you, thank you all very much for, for the kind comments. And I, and I recognize I'm the one sitting here, so I'm I will accept all of those things on behalf of the staff. I just want to make sure everybody is aware that the staff are the ones who carry so much of that load. So um, we we really do appreciate uh, your kind words. In terms of one membership, so I guess or Sackville Sports Stadium. So Sackville Sports Stadium actually used to be a community board run facility, and it was taken it was brought back in house. Um, number of years ago, probably 15 to 20 years ago. And so it, it, it's, it's very similar to, I, I guess the word MDF is really, it's, it's just, it's a term that HRM has called it, but they're really major facilities. The, the ones that serve multiple districts, the ones that have multiple types of components. This one membership model, we would envision any number of our facilities that that are similar in nature. So I would see Sapsa Sports Stadium being part of it. I'd also see some of the other HRM operated facilities. So if you, some of the more large, the larger ones that have things like pools or, or rinks or, so if you take something like Captain Warren Spry, it has a pool, it has um, the library, it has a number of different assets in it, within it. So we would see similar type um, facilities all falling under that one model whereby whether you, know, you get a membership, you could go to multiple different locations. So the whole premise of it is, is you know, when life goes back to normal and people live in one community and work in another, that you have flexibility if you wanted to pop into uh, an HRM operate, or, sorry, an HRM owned facility on your lunch hour or after work, you could. So that's the premise of it. What is needed, we, we need to do, um, it's a bit of a unique feature in the sense that we are somewhat unique in the amount of facilities that we have alternate service delivery operated by community partners. Many municipalities don't have this same model. So it is something that we have to roll up our sleeves and figure out how best to manage it, considering the fact that so many of our facilities are operated by third parties with, with you know, essentially full responsibility to set out the, the pricing and the, and the programming and whatnot. So it's, it's, it's not something that 
Um, there's a, a similar model out there that we can we can learn from where we are kind of breaking ground. So it's it is a complex piece of work, but uh, over the next little bit, when we figure out kind of scope out how best to do it, that's we, we should be able to come back and speak a little more intelligently about it. But but we would definitely envision things like the Southwest Force Stadium to be part of it. The report for over, if if um, we wanted to ensure that council was aware that those three are are still outstanding, those staff reports, and that we will be back soon. If if you, I mean, you you have the I guess the, the ability to to allocate the funding now. If you if you choose not to, when we bring the report, we would outline how they would be paid. So would, where the funding would have to come from, whether it's it is a um, shuffling from something else, from surplus, that kind of thing. So there is. It's not an absolute critical. I, I, um, I will defer to the CFO in case I happen to speak slightly out of term. I don't think it's critical that you have to move it forward today or through this process, but it's certainly, if you know you want to do it, um, you, you, have the, you have the choice. It's certainly when we bring the report back, we would outline how, how to fund it at that time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Uh, I see Jane has popped up. Go Chair, ahead, just just to expand on what uh, what Denise was saying on the uh, on the funding source. So every report does come with the funding source. Uh, the only difference is uh, depending on you know if it's after budget, uh, it would likely be reserves, or depending on where where we are from a projection point of view, uh, or shifting within within the budget. The uh, the surplus would have been uh, transferred to uh, to reserve by the time that the reports and a decision would be. So that's the only slight nuance I'd like to make. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, thank you very much for assuming the chair. Um, I'm going to resume the chair, if you will, uh, and would like to proceed with uh, Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just had to find the delete button or the mute button. Anyway, I'd like to add my accolades to Denise and, and her entire staff. They didn't do pivots, they did pirouettes. And I can tell you, I can tell you they did with panache and style. They had to zig and zag when, when, the, when the punches and the, when the changes came around. And, and uh, I think they did it as flawlessly as possible under the circumstances. And I wanna uh, add my accolades to, to Denise and her team. Um, in regards to the uh, some other things you talked about already, about the facility lease agreements or the facility management agreements, uh, we have a number of those community uh, facilities that are municipally owned and volunteer operated. And our supplies, I believe there's already been a uh, motion passed, I think, of that earlier discussion today. But I just want to make sure that my facilities, such as the East Preston Rec Center, the Lake Echo Community Center, the Lake and Shore Facility in Porter's Lake, the Balcom Center, and uh, Port Dufferin, the Moja River Community Hall, the uh, St. Therese Center in Grand Desert, and the Sheet Harbor uh, facility, the Lion Center as it still exists, uh, and also the Eastern Shore Community Center, which is the rank, uh, still has that support for the municipality to keep uh, ongoing uh, programs available. Um, in regards to the recent experience with the uh, COVID pandemic, I'm hoping that sometime we can have a uh, a request perhaps that our boat launches be taken out of the definition of parks because you know here we are had citizens trying to get to a place of um, isolation where they could uh, get away and, and stay for a period of time but they weren't allowed access to their cottages via the lakes but because the boat launches were considered parkland and closed off so i don't know what it will take for us to remove the definition perhaps i may i need to ask for a supplementary report on how that could be brought forward to remove um, our access to waterways um, through boat launches being removed from the definition of parks. So I, I, I don't know if that to be a, a, a difficult thing to do to ask for, but uh, I think we need to clarify that point. In regards to the bike parks that we talked about earlier, I have one there at St. Therese Center in Grand Desert that needs to perhaps have some uh, tender loving care. I set aside some money for them uh, from district capital funds last year. They'll be utilizing the spring to do some drainage corrections, but they may, need, they may need a bit of top up with soil conditions, whatever, to um, groom, the, groom the track. But um, I just wanted to uh, just say thanks again for everything. I'm looking forward to the, the playground re re list review. 
I'm looking forward to this recreation, rural recreation survey. Uh, I'm glad you have the deadline until May 23rd to allow for ample opportunity for the citizens to participate, especially give us the uh, opportunity to give uh, fair, fair notice to our community news, newspapers uh, that can occur. And uh, that's about it, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was quite pleased with this process this year, and especially with the, the performance of the department. I'm looking forward to more performance in the future. The only thing I'm looking forward to is perhaps now that we have, uh, for instance, some of our park planning processes under place, we need to get, um, you know, for instance, like Echo uh, master plan that's been done. Uh, I'd like to get it at least to next year or the year, uh, at least the construction phase started. We did the we did the consultation, the design, the plan sitting there now, sitting on a shelf. And now we've got to find the money to move forward. That's the only thing I'm frustrated about is we go forward with these park planning, playground plans, whatever case would be, but it takes, there seems to be a lag in time there. So I don't know how can we accelerate those uh, gaps and, and to minimize the gaps in between the park planning and the actual implementation, because we have expectations out there by the public. And now it's sitting on a shelf waiting for it to be identified in the capital budget. So I don't know how Denise would make a comment on how we could tighten up that gap between consultation, design, and, and construction. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. I could say I didn't care what Councillor, because if you've ever seen me dance, that's not something that's pretty. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been a pirouette, I can tell you that much. Um, in terms of yeah, the motion that's already been forward, we would be outlining the funding support through all facilities, whether they're the small community facilities, the medium ones. So the ones that you listed would be included in in that report that we bring back. Uh, the bike paths, yeah. So as as I said uh, when we we're responding to Councillor Mancini, you know, we're, this team's the first one to admit we didn't have our seasonal staff last year. We had a few, but but it was only uh, as part of the COVID budget adjustment when the things were, you know, when the restrictions kept changing. So we do have a plan for um, getting some maintenance done on those, all of our bike parks this year. Ray's been working on a, on a strategy for that. So we anticipate that that's one of the ones that uh, would fall under that. Uh, boat launches, what a, if, if I could ask council, why don't we take that one offline? I, I suspect, I think just on the surface, I think what we would need probably to do is, is look at a bit of a bylaw amendment. So rather than a briefing note, which is probably just gonna say we have to do this process, if we can take that offline and work and determine what the process is, then we can circle back to council on the implementation. It's, I, on the surface, I think it's probably a bylaw amendment. So, um, but rather fair. writing you a briefing note to just tell you that if we can. Fair work enough. Fair enough, because I think I think not just boat launch, but some of our trails that are outside parks may also be included because we've had you know shutting down parks one thing, but trails were another. So. Yeah, and the and the the order shutting part by the, the way that the order the provincial order was written, and the fact that the way our bylaw is written, it it, it captured a lot of those in the by uh, sorry it captured a lot in the order that I don't think they necessarily may be intended. So um, I'm pretty sure at the time my recollection is that when we had a quick look at it, it was going to be a bylaw amendment. So if we can take that offline, we'll figure out a process for that. And in terms of park plan, so yeah, so it. I guess the, the, the thing I would say about park plans and, and similar to the comment when I was speaking with Councillor Lovelace, you know, we've, we've got a number of parks that we still have to do plans for and we're working through them kind of methodically. The, what we don't want to end up with is a situation where we have a perfectly good asset and taking out a good asset just because we have a park plan plan. So it's about balancing the park plan, when work needs to be done in the park, what new pieces of work we could do. So we certainly are looking at that from a capital point of view, because you're right. We citizens help us come up with those plans. There's an expectation. And then we want to be able to ensure that we start to have some implementation without spending good money after bad on an asset that isn't needed, but certainly other components that can get done. So it is something the team's looking at for capital budget. Um, now it'll be for next year to see where, what, what pieces of work we can get done and where. Thank you very much. Uh, we're starting on the second round of uh, questions. So, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Denise, I was going to bring up the gray arena, but over the lunch break, I was chatting with some of your staff. And so, I understand the staff report and recommendation on the gray arena is coming back now, that first meeting in May. So, I'll really save my comments and questions uh, until then. Uh, but for my colleagues, especially the newer colleagues, uh, Denise alluded to 
AO50 earlier, uh, Gray Arena is an example of uh, uh, an asset that's considered to be surplus at the time, and it went through the AO50 process. And so um, we can talk more about that when we come back in May. And I, I appreciate that, Denise. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I just clarify that, Councillor. It's actually a planning report that's coming back. My staff is helping work on that, but just uh, just for clarification, it's actually coming back through plan planning and development. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, we, we can chat offline to get started. Right. Sure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Denise. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. So. Um, I spoke to one of the uh, the overs that were put in there, but I haven't spoken to the main motion yet. I'm going to put my own over in. Uh, but first, of course, like everyone else, and I won't ask you to do a pirouette, uh, Denise, uh, but thank your staff and you in that order, because uh, I know uh, the community developers, the folks who do the maintenance on our parks, who are putting in the playgrounds and maintaining them and doing all that stuff and pulling out the garbage and putting locks on fences. And, uh, you know, that was just some amazing stuff. So uh, like everyone else has, thank you, your whole department. Uh, so what I would like to do though, is for, uh, I'm just pulling it up here so I can see it. Uh, it's the over for the, uh, uh, do, 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 it's in the, First section, second uh, piece, $125,000, uh, public art piece at the Queen's Mark. Um, and I'm not sure how to word it because it wouldn't be in the operating budget per se. It would be, be for an over, and I'm assuming it would come from uh, a one-time pot of money. And so I'll, I'll let the clerk put that in there. But the reason I'm doing this, and I'm not sure how many people have had a chance Second, to look at Councillor Mason. Thank you, Councillor Mason. I'm not sure how many people have looked at the report that came to us. I think it was in September 29th uh, last year. So it would have been before the election and our, our new councillors might not have read it yet, but it was on the public art piece. And uh, Eduardo Trisoldi, who is the uh, one uh, that they've uh, been looking to do the, the work and there's a conceptual drawing in there and his work is, is world famous, it's fantastic. Uh, and this would be a, a small portion of the overall cost of doing the artwork. And not only would it bring um, some uh, uh, attention to Halifax in general, it would be a wonderful piece uh, uh, on, on an incredible piece of land that is visited by uh, tourists, by the, the thousands and, and hundreds of thousands, you know, outside of COVID, and by residents of, of uh, Nova Scotia and Halifax on a regular basis. And so for those reasons, I think it's really important to put this in the parking lot and, and have a discussion about it. Uh, because it is something that I think, um, you know, even in these times, uh, we can't forget and neglect the public realm and our contribution to that public realm. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, we have on the floor right now the motion for the public art piece for Queen's Mark. This is $125,000. We're simply waiting for uh, the formal wording to come up. In the meantime, please, if you would like to speak to this motion, uh, put your name in the chat and go ahead, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I wonder if I can get a clarification, Denise. My understanding, the, in your presentation, the options under budget, you've got three items in there, including the one the Councillor just brought forward. My understanding of these are, are they not already in the budget? Uh, and then the it's uh, and this section is about potentially this is something that could be cut if if a council if, chooses to bring it forward. Can you clarify no, that? Sure. Yeah, actually, if, actually, it's actually if I if I can sorry. jump in, sorry, you were going to go exactly where I was. You go ahead, Denise. No, it's it's actually the next page. So the one that you're looking at, Councillor, is the public art grant. This is a specific grant on the next page for Queens Mark. So this was a request, and then as the councillor mentioned, we brought a report back in September. Uh, uh, council specifically and I had asked for a staff report on this specific request. So it's a one-time grant and you're right, it would be an operating grant of operating funding. So a one-time grant to, to put towards the piece of art that uh, council, I won't re reiterate council Cleary's comments. So. Thank you for that clarification. My mistake on that. Thank you. Mr. Okay. Chair. 
Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hensby. Can I say clarification? I thought we had a public art policy in regards to when that development was approved, a portion of that development uh, value was going to go to public art. So does that money get uh, assigned to an account that we, 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 we draw from, or is that a part that they have to put in from their, from their resources to put in that public art? How could clarify the difference? I thought they were responsible to be a part of the development process to get the agreement in place that they have to put the public art in as a part of their uh, structure cost. Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you, the council. So, so there, the the developers, the, there is the the piece of public art is being put in as part of this. This is to supplement it because it's a, as Councilor Clary mentioned, it's a it's a world renowned artist and it's a very um, impactful piece. So we shall we say so. The the thought is in order to get. Um, such such a world renowned piece is they they came forward and requested some uh, additional supplemental funding from the municipality to put towards it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Savage. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. So I'm glad the council of Clary brought this forward. And I know that there might be some people that would think, you know, why would we do this uh, at, at this point in time? You know, this is. Uh, uh, at a development that has, I haven't seen the report recently, Denise, but there's something like $6 million in total public art as part of this development. This one piece is gonna be cost shared. The proposal I think was $150,000 from Develop Nova Scotia, 300,000 from the developer, perhaps something of, of that line. Um, and we do have a public art policy, probably needs some you know, more, more work, but when this did come, I think uh, staff did recommend that we consider this as part of the uh, budget process. and. It's been a tough time for hotels and businesses during COVID. It's also a tough time to open a major new $200 million totally private development on, on the waterfront, um, uh, which now has Peace by Chocolate as one of its, uh, uh, one of its uh, businesses. Um, this is something that I think that is worth considering at this, it's a one-time ask. I think we can easily uh, find, find that money to support this development, but more particularly to support the whole concept of public art, which I think we need more of um in the uh in the city so i don't have any problem in in uh, supporting this and i thank Councilor clary for putting it on the floor for the parking lot thank you okay thank you very much uh councillor mason thank you mr chair uh what the mayor said what uh, Councilor clary said uh you know i would add uh to help clarify around our various public art uh pieces is there's a, a commitment to uh, take a percentage of the budget of every uh, public uh, building that HRM builds and put public art into it. And that's who ended up with the uh, cards on the wall in the central library uh, and other art around HRM. There's a commitment to uh, allow public art as one of the density bonusing uh, provisions of the downtown plan. But there's also a public art policy that should be, in my opinion, funded so that there's a, a grant process uh, or, or, or a funding process there so that our staff can actually solicit art. Because one, one of the things that happens is if you only wait for people to have money to put up art, then you only get a certain kind of art. So, you know, the idea of the public art policy originally was that there would be annual funding there. We have not gotten to that point yet. Uh, so we're not actually commissioning public art uh, the way I think they originally planned. And that was 15 years ago. We just haven't been able to get there yet. Uh, uh, I'd love to see it happen. So I do support this. I think that, it, you know, it is a great, uh, strong, a piece of art that is substantially more than uh, in, in cost and, and investment than uh, we'd be contributing. And uh, I think that it'll be a real, uh, uh, you know, a, a strong statement to make on the Halifax waterfront. So I will support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I see no further speakers uh, in the chat on public art. I, uh, go ahead, uh, Councillor Cuddle. Oh, I... I do just have a question about um, why this is sitting in the parks and recreation budget, um, like the, the public art piece. Is that where public art lives? Yeah, yes, Councillor, Councillor through you to, to the, uh, through, through the chair of the council. Yeah, so public art is, falls under a culture and events team. And uh, we, um, 
have oversight over the public art policy that the, the council has been speaking about and um, have have staff who, who work on that. So that's, and then the request came to, we were, we were asked to do a report on this and that's why it's it's back in, in our budget because uh, we were the ones who did the report. And I guess for any, for the new councillors, Councillor Clary actually posted a copy of the, a link to the report in the chat. So if uh, if you haven't had a chance to see that report, it's, it's there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just trying to recall, um, perhaps the Councillor Mason, whatever, or we, we talked about the public art policy for some time now. And I remember back in the days, it was Councillor Larry Utech that first brought up the discussions about we need to have a public uh, art uh, policy, perhaps a percentage of the development permits uh, that are being uh, issued be uh, like a 1% or a charge to go to a public art fund, or maybe a cost or, or portion of the cost of the project be, be their component of be a public art. So I'd like to know where, where we stand on that public art policy. You know, is that something we still need to bring forward from original planning amendments from the future, from the near future? Um, I'd like to have, you know, if we're going to have a public art fund, we should have a dedicated source of funding from it, and it should be from new development. And that's all I'd like to see it from. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair, do you to the council? So you're right, council. We had a we had a public art policy. We actually updated it. I think it was last last year times kind of blending in the, the piece about um, being able to get funding from development that's all tied in with uh, the culture and heritage priorities plan and and um, being able to actually there's, there's a charter amendment or something I, I believe that it's part of the regional plan work that Kelly's team is doing so there she may have more information on that when she presents next week but the, it's it's things like um, um, a cost sharing and whatnot from developments. There is a charter piece that has to go with that in order to be able to fully implement it. So, so we've done the other pieces, the stuff that we do have direct authority and whatnot. We updated that based on a motion from Council Austin last year, but there is still some work to be done. And I, we might even have a request into the, to the province for it. Or I'm just drawing a bit of a blank on it, but I do know that there was additional um, legislative type work that had to happen for it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and just for the record, the motion is that the budget committee include $125,000 in one-time funding for costs associated with a public art piece, Queensmark, with a proposed 2021-22 parks and recreation budget in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. Um, so that has been moved. The, uh, there are no further speakers in the chat. So I would uh, like the clerk to run through the roll for the question, please. Beginning with District 2, Councillor Henley. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Councillor Blackburn. 15, Chair Russell. In favor? Deputy Mayor Oathead. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor? Mayor Savage. In favor? Thank you. That motion passes. Councillor Blackburn, we were not able to hear you even though your mic was not on mute. We are back to the main motion uh, and Councillor Cuddle is next. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, um, I know that there's been um, some negotiations going on with the land leases with the province. Um, 
in terms of having HRM assets like ball fields um, and other things on provincially leased land um, and that upgrades and repairs or, um, you know, I don't, I don't even know if maintenance is being done on those fields at the moment. Just wondering where that is right now. And, you know, has have those negotiations reached a conclusion? And is there a backlog of any work to be done on those assets on provincial land? And is that in the budget? Um, that's question one. Um, the other question is about the rural recreation strategy. I'm very excited that that got launched today. That's that's fantastic. And um, I would suggest that those community partners with all those uh, recreation facilities across the uh, across the uh, municipality would be great opportunities to spread the word about that strategy. I'm just wondering if there's going to be any opportunity for more stakeholder consultations, particularly with those community partners, um, just in term, just to determine what the partnering opportunities might be or what the capacity of those partners are to play a role in the rural recreation strategy. And I'm also wondering in that strategy if there'll be an opportunity for councillors to have input, if there'll be any kind of um, roundtable consultations conversations about that. You know, I'm particularly interested in how the rural recreation strategy um, kind of builds on other opportunities that are happening. I know I've spoken about this before, but like the tourism strategy, economic development strategies. So it's not just seen, you know, I've looked, I took a quick look at the survey and uh, over lunch and I'm just, you know, not, so it's not just in terms of like, serving local residents, but it's seen as a larger strategy in the development of the municipality as a whole. Um, that would be my other question. And, and just to kind of add on to what my other colleagues have said around um, your depart you and your department's ability to really respond to COVID, one thing I do want to note is the work that was put in to opening facilities um, to provide shelters, um, food distribution, you know, for, for those who were homeless, those who were in, shel in shelters, you know, when many other places were unable to find the ability to do that, your team said yes, so, you know, you said yes, and you, and you did it. And I just want to, you know, commend everybody on that. I thought it was, it was remarkable. And the community partners that you worked with on that, um, I heard nothing but positive glowing things. So um, thank you in particular for that. That was wonderful. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, in terms of, so the land lease, the report is getting finalized. Um, I think it's with me. Um, so it should be back shortly. We're always negotiating. We're always in discussion with the province. So there's a a bit of a, a back and forth as to um, whether we should be leasing some land, whether we should be owning it outright. So again, little history lesson, many of these areas, many of the, the former county had a number of its recreation assets on provincial land. And the reason why the leases are so important is HRM is not permitted, not able to spend money on land that it doesn't own. A long-term lease under the charter essentially becomes acts like ownership. And that's when what, what triggers us to be able to um, then spend money, do maintenance, do upgrades. So that's why the, these leases are so important and the, the need for a reasonable rent or lease amount from the province as opposed to having um, the province charging such an exorbitant amount that it actually impacts the ability for a municipality to then provide that recreation service. So I know uh, what I can tell you is that we're finalizing the report. So I would say it's it's also within a matter of, of weeks, it should be back at council. And that will give a bit of an overview of kind of where we got to, where we still have to go and what the options are for how we move forward with the province. Uh, in terms of the rural rec strategy, and I guess I'll just do a bit of a plug. So thank you, Council Lovelace, for for mentioning for answering the question that, um, about the survey being. It's actually just again for everybody's knowledge, it's on the, the main page of HRM because it launched today. It's actually right on front page of of the website, so that it can get as mo the max coverage. Um, it'll move in, into back pages later on, but right now it's on that front page of HRM's website. Um, in terms of counts, any of these strategies that we do counsel, absolutely. One of the big pieces of work that we do is consultation with counselors, either in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, that kind of thing. And there is uh, components of 
additional the stakeholders will be a big part of it as well. We, you know, again, we seem to be uh, talking COVID a lot, but you know, COVID has really changed how we have to do engagement because normally we would be sitting in rooms with people and having community meetings. The survey is one component of it, as Angela has described, but there will certainly be other components. It's, it's really the kickoff component, so we can start to get some information, and then we'll kind of delve into uh, various different stakeholders and what, what options are, as well as individual counselors who are interested or willing to uh, provide some feedback to us. That's great. And just to follow up, just back to the provincial land lease piece. I know you said the report is coming through. I'm yep. just wondering if there's going to be any financial implications related to that in terms of catching up on the, you know, backlog of maintenance that's required on those assets. So the the financial implication that the, it's more of a capital component because the ones we, we tend to, we can do a little bit of maintenance. It's the question that we can't do capital. So, so those would be coming forward in capital budgets going forward. So as Council David Gammon, the one she mentioned, there's a, a field in that particular area that has been on the tap on the books to have lights for a number of years. We actually can't do that capital project without the lease. So, so it's more um, the capital costs will be impacted as opposed to the day-to-day -day maintenance in terms of there could potentially, if we ended up deciding to buy one out, a piece of land outright, that would come out of the uh, parkland acquisition reserve. So, so there is funding that is allocated for various things. It's it wouldn't have a, a direct impact to this particular operating budget. Okay, I just want to make sure that should that get done, that there's money in this year's budget to go and do that ma that maintenance backlog, and that it wasn't not included in the budget because the land leases weren't signed. Hey, no, Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Cuddle. Okay, thank you. Denise, if you would like to. No, I was, just, I was just going to clarify that we, ha we have a, a running tally, a list of, of funding for all of our maintenance um, projects. And the, the, the team is very good at, at figuring out ways to get the maintenance done as efficiently and, and cost effectively as possible. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd also want to echo uh, some of the comments that were made, Denise, about the very quick action. Uh, you know, with regards to some of the uh, vandalism, um, you know, unsightly graffiti and so on and so forth, uh, just really nice to know that staff jump and take that very seriously, uh, especially when there are, you know, racist uh, or misogynistic <laughs> connotations involved. And, and so just want to say thank you. Uh, you know, on Sunday afternoon, boom, you know, dispatch, they're out there and they're, and they're trying to clean that up. So thanks for that. And on that note, I'm just wondering, from a safety perspective and vandalism and so on, where that fits within the budget? And are we seeing an increase? Are we seeing a decrease? I know that we're working uh, to address, uh, you know, uh, better safety and thinking about safety before we're installing some of these structures and, and placement of these parks and, you know, ensuring that there's um, a sight line from the road. Uh, in my uh, lovely tour of District 2 yesterday, Councillor Hensby and I were chatting about, you know, we got to take some of those trees down or take some of that brush down uh, to make sure that there is clear sight line uh, to to the parks. I'm just wondering if this is in your budget, if it, it, is it somewhere else? Is it a TPW uh, issue? Um, I found the washroom strategy because <laughs> when you got to go, you got to go. So, you know, th this is really important um, in thinking about how we provide, you know, that full kind of complete uh, facility with parks, you know, St. Margaret's Bay Rails to Trails, 32 kilometers, no place to be. Um, so, you know, people are going in the woods and uh, it's just, it's creating gross and disgusting and unhealthy environment. Uh, so thinking about uh, where District 13 and other rural areas fit within that washroom survey through my quick uh, scan, I didn't see any. Uh, so I just wanted to, to see like, are there ways that we can continue to build and grow on that, work with our community partners. Um, grateful that we have accessibility bathroom now, the Hubbard's uh, library, which is awesome. But of course they're only open so many hours, gonna have a new washroom facility at Peggy's Cove, that will change uh, things for us. I also wanna echo the boat launch issue. Um, 
you know, people want to be able to park the vehicles and, and head to the island, uh, you know, for a night, uh, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with, uh, you know, how that restriction impacts uh, some of our community members. And I want to talk about tulips, um, because horticulture issues, of course, are, you know, um, really great, it's beautiful, adds beautification. Uh, but this previous spring and chatting with uh, some of the folks, there were something like 2000 tulip bulbs that didn't have a home to go to. And um, they were gonna head to Hammond's Plains uh, to the Boulevard Garden. And I'm just wondering whether or not we're being as efficient as we can uh, with regards to some of those uh, uh, plantings and maybe tulips, if, if we're storing tulip bulbs, you know, maybe that's not the way that we should go. Maybe we should be, per uh, uh, you know, planting something else. And the last thing, because I know I'm running out of time, is universal design and the implementation of universal design methodology to ensure that we're creating uh, structures and play places and, um, you know, facilities that meet those universal uh, design needs of, of all of our citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks, much. Uh... Okay, yep, no, I'll try and quickly get, uh, get answers to this. So absolutely. So um, crime prevention through environmental design is a big part of our design and Councillor Hensby's absolutely right. Eyes on streets, eyes on parks. People, um, it, it certainly helps reduce vandalism. It's, it's one of the most effective ways is, is having good sight lines. Um, we do have um, various programs related to graffiti and you're absolutely right. Particularly when there's uh, really problematic graffiti, we are on it. We have, uh, we have contracts with the uh, graffiti companies and, and whatnot. So that, that is part of, of our budget with the parks component, as well as, T I know TPW has some on streets as well. So it is, uh, depending on where the graffiti is, it falls under different uh, departments. Um, the washroom strategy, yeah. So that we have, as, you, as I've said, you know, over 900 parks, we have a lot of places to put washroom. The strategy, starts us with a focus. We have a number of washroom facilities that are way past their prime. So the strategy recommends that we get those resolved first because they exist and, uh, and they need to be maintained properly. And then it recommends really much more of a, of a strategy to get a dispersion of washrooms across different parks. Raise team through, through parks in, in interim if there are particularly popular locations, we will de deploy some porta potties. They're not, a, you know, not ideal, but certainly in a in a pinch, they will uh, um, they they will certainly help. Um, the tulips, yes. So I guess I may ask Ray to jump in if there's something specific. There, tulip bulbs will get dried out, and you can't use them sometimes. So, but I'm not aware of a specific such time. A situation where we had a bunch of bulbs that we couldn't use. The team, the horticultural team, has a real, as as Councillor Austin said, it, it's an art to them. It's the they come up with a plan, it's a strategy, and they are absolutely lovers of flowers. They do not want to see any flower go to waste. And if there's an, uh, an opportunity to use them, they ensure that they get used. So um, I'm not sure if there's a, was a specific reason. Sometimes we'll have people try and donate tulips or, or bulbs to us that and if we already have the plan. So I suspect it might've been that situation that somebody was trying to donate um, flat bulbs or flowers to us when, and we had already um, placed all of our flowers in our, in our beds. And quickly, uh, universal design, absolutely. That's a, you know, there's, there's a number of strategies across HRM whereby, it, you know, universal washrooms are being built into new facilities and we're looking to have um, standards across um, all of our, our asset classes so that people understand what they're getting, where, where they're located, what they're going to get in that particular asset, and that they are, can be provided a service to all, all users. And speaking of watchers, I know, I know that everybody's trying to get a break, so I was trying to be as quick as I could. And I appreciate that. It is uh, 2.38. Let's take a 15 minute break. Um, and come back at five to three at uh, two fifty-five. Uh, seeing as uh, Councillor Lovelace talked about washrooms, now might be. We will see you at two fifty-five. Thank you. Just another reminder.
Mr. Chair, we're ready to restore your sound and video. I think we have quorum and stuff. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give it just a minute and then go ahead. It is 2.55 according to my clock, so let's go ahead, uh, uh, Mayor Savage. Right, thank you, Chair, and uh, and lots of accolades uh, for Denise, um, as there was for Brad last week, and I, I'm going to throw an accolade at our CAO, because a number of years ago, we had an opening at uh, TPW, and uh, I remember Jacques saying to me, look, I think I can, I want to put Brad in at TPW, and because Denise is ready to run Parks and Rec, and it was a a great call. It's given us, it's given two people a chance to show what they can do and potential uh, CAOs of the municipality, but it was really good, I thought, succession uh, planning. So Jacques, uh, to you, uh, congratulations. Listen, um, I'm, I'm glad with where we're going. And, um, you know, I, a lot of these over budgets are, are one-timers, and I, which I think makes it a little easier. I think we can have the discussion with Jane when they come back and hopefully find the money. I don't want to produce or suggest any, any of the unders. The Discovery Center needs the money. Uh, the arts grants uh, are important. I want to speak to, uh, and I was going to speak to the public art piece, but that's been taken care of. So, and I agree too that the, the staff reports will come back. And as Jane indicated, if they come back with funding that's uh, required, she will uh, suggest a funding source. I do support the municipality being in some way supportive of the art gallery. I don't know if it's 1.4 million a year for five years. I think we need to have a conversation uh, around that. Uh, I think it's gonna provide enormous benefits across the municipality as well as across the province. We'll be the prime beneficiary and I think it's only reasonable that we consider support, but I wanna see the report when it comes back, have that conversation. Um, it is gonna be a transformative piece on our waterfront. Um, and I think we need to wait too on, on Neptune. I Look, I. Uh, Everybody knows Neptune. We have amazing theater across the province. I think we, uh, I think they just had the merit awards for theater. Um, I usually, I tried to go to that and because uh, it's amazing the number of theater groups we have across the province. Neptune is obviously a big one, not only for themselves, but they support the arts community in a lot of different ways too. And I want to find a way to be supportive of Neptune, but I think it's time. We need to wait for the report to come back on that. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that if it's a, uh, uh, a case the council decides to support that we'll find the funding at that uh, point in time. So I think that's all I have for today. Uh, I think the, the way that we're doing this makes sense, investing in things that have a return on investment like the events and discover management, and then looking at significant projects that benefit the entire municipality. And uh, once again, Denise, thank you to, uh, to you and your team. That's all for me, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And Councillor Smith. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just to further on comments uh, earlier, Denise, the legend software. So two questions. I know that the, some of the staffing counts you mentioned are related to legend, uh, turning crap for temporary jobs to, to, to full-time jobs or permanent jobs. I'm wondering two things, the flexibility with the software itself that we are able to to handle and how much we rely on the, I'm not sure who the maker is, but the maker of legends to support us when we want to, you know, a perfect example when you're talking about the oval, needing to change how it functions. So how do we, how do we maneuver when we need changes with this new software? Sure, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the staff that, that you noted that are, converting from project to operational, they do all of the, um, the configuration. So anytime we, so all of the changes that we had to do for legend and then put the contracts in, take the mode, all of that, that's, that's HRM staff. What the, because we bought software as a service, so it's a lot like the, the software on our phones and whatnot, what we rely on the legend companies, much like Apple software, they do up, upgrades and new capabilities. 
So they're they're building the new capability for things like the equipment loan. That that's something they build new capability once it's implemented or once it's built. Then our staff, the staff that we um, have, will do all the implementation. So our staff do all the inputting of of the the programs, the schedules, the prices, the times, all of that. So when I had mentioned in my presentation, but the, these are the same staff who've been working on the project to implement it across the board. They were doing all of those changes at the same time during COVID. So we have, it, 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 as software as a service, it gives us um, flexibility to adapt our programming, but we don't have to have, you know, um, Jane's team in ICT doesn't have to be building stuff, building the capability. So the software will build, or the software company will build it, and then we'll we'll implement it the way that it needs to be for us. It's also a piece of software that's now in some of the other major cities across the country. So say for Toronto, if Toronto does new capabilities, we'll take advantage of that and be able to, to use that as well. So, and vice versa, anything of where the, where the city that's leading the case on equipment loans, if other cities want to then use that, they can. So we're comfortable we, with what we're going to be able to do with it. Right. So when we make, when we make changes or we adapt, um, so say the other season, for example, the housing wants to, to use the legend software because they want to do the one membership um, piece. If, if they want to adopt something that we have created, understanding our changes, do we provide them with some kind of information or do they say to the legend company, hey, HRM does this, we want the same thing. So in, 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 in that, so if our staff are creating pieces, are we then giving it to legend so then they can use it? Well, we don't, we don't create anything. We use the stuff that they create and, and, and use it for our, our purposes. So okay. if Dalhousie wanted to join Legend, they would purchase that from, from Legend. And then we would, um, they, they could then work with us to align their programming. So it's input similar to ours so that for citizens, they, they don't have to learn two different kinds of software. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so when it comes to the budget, are, are you aware of us? in the future needing to purchase more of a license or, or any type of expansions. I don't know what, what it would be for legend or are we, and we won't expect to see any, any uh, changes when it comes to that budget. Cause it was a large, at the time, it was a large, large budget. Yeah, it was a huge capital project, several million. So we're, we're, we're near the end of that. We've got a few little pieces of work that we're still doing, but we don't anticipate um, software as a service. We don't necessarily anticipate similar big chunks again um, in, in, in the short term, we will then, we'll be using this software similar to class class we had for 30 years. I'm not sure what legend will be 30 years, but certainly it's a, it's a long standing or long term commitment that we've made. We don't anticipate another big junk chunk of change um, for, for years to come. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Stoddard. Good afternoon. Um, I don't know. I haven't, as a new counselor, I haven't dealt with um, you or your staff a lot. Um, but from everything I've heard and experienced, um, you're doing an awesome job. So I thank you for that. I just had a couple of questions. Um, I know we, as you heard, my um, constituents are very passionate about parks and trails. Um, just wondering if there's any update as to any any um, steps to acquire um, the Blue Mountain Birch Lake Co. trails in Parkland, please. Sure, sure, Council. Yeah, so that is a um, uh, direction that Council has provided to staff. So we are continually um, reaching out and trying to negotiate possible um, acquisitions. I'm, I'm carefully choosing my words. What we don't want to do is show our hand on any particular parcel that we're interested in or any particular price, because that limits our ability and, and our negotiating power. So uh, it is direction that council has given to staff to focus on that as well as some other parkland acquisitions. And we are definitely, staff are still working on that. What I would suggest maybe counselor is um, that we should maybe connect with you offline and give we can give you some specific details. I just don't want to um, impact our ability and, and our negotiating power in a public forum. Certainly, I can do, we can do that. Um, my other question was, um, 
Dog parks and dog waste is an issue um, all through HRM and probably all through Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that there's going to be a park, I'm oh, sorry, a dog waste pilot in my district. Could you talk a little bit more about that, please? I'm going to actually ask Ms. Ray Walsh to talk about that. It's definitely something that we're working on with TPW, but he has many more. He, he can explain it much better than I can. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, to, to, through you to the councillor. Uh, yes, councillor, we are implementing a pilot project uh, at the mainland common dog park. And it is a, basically it's an in-ground unit where the dog waste and bags will be dropped into and it can hold uh, quite a bit from what I understand. Um, we are working closely with our colleagues in solid waste on this pilot. Um, Currently now we're, we are, we, we do have a, a vendor. We're just uh, a, a couple of vendors in mind. Uh, we'll have to go through our procurement process to determine which is going to be best. Uh, and we are currently looking at to see where and who can take and facilitate the waste once it's removed um, from the, uh, from, from the, from the unit, the in-ground unit. Um, in terms of uh, uh, until then, we'll continue with our uh, garbage cans and we have additional, as Denise had mentioned earlier, uh, we this year will have the opportunity to deploy our additional seasonals that uh, we, we didn't get a chance to do last year. Part of their responsibility will be uh, to, um, to be part of our 14 little routes that we have to make sure that those garbages, particularly dog waste, doesn't overflow or fill up. Um, we like to empty them as quick as possible to keep the, of course, the, the smell and, you know, the things down and the, it's improve the aesthetics of the park by not having a, a, a um, you know, garbage can completely full to the brim. So those are some of the things we'll, you'll see this, uh, this coming season. Great. Looking forward to that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm wondering, uh, Councillor Stoddard, if you have anything further. Oh, I have, I have time left. <laughs> you have one minute. Oh, okay. Um, let me just see. Um, CGC is in my district, and I'm just wondering about their funding. Um, do you know if it's COVID related or if it's just um, funding that they're short of? Or it's it's COVID related, Council. They Typically, Canada Game Center is able to break even without uh, support from HRM, without some right. subsidies. But with the the reduction in the number of people who can participate in class and classes, and the added cost for cleaning supplies and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, that that is, we anticipate that's a, a uh, similar to some of the other ones this this year, and then they'll likely be back to a, a break even per point. Okay, so that would be a one off then. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to step out of the chair for uh, a couple of minutes. Earlier, I had uh, mentioned the op the overs pending staff reports, and I am so, so Councillor Daigle Gammon, if you wouldn't mind uh, stepping into the chair, I would appreciate it. I'm going to start the clock on myself. I'm sure everybody else is too. Um, I'm interested in in a couple of the overs pending staff reports, and what I would like to do is uh, talk about them one at a time. And at this point, it would be easier to uh, allocate the funds and, and make sure that we know where the funds are coming from so that uh, when we get the reports back, uh, the funds would immediately be there and we wouldn't have to ask Jane to uh, go out and find them and, and take care of something else. And the one that interests me most is the multi-service youth uh, center. This is otherwise known as the den. Uh, and this is, this is a um, housed at the uh, Sackville Library at, at Acadia School on Sackville Drive. And it was operating for a year. There was a pilot program. And by all accounts, uh, this was going incredibly well. It, it, when I talk about it being multi-service, it had uh, HRM, it had provincial, it had health, it had all sorts of people. And th there was a group called Posse that came in and youth would come in with challenges, um, not physical challenges, but other challenges. And the staffing at this center would be able to work with those youth and help them sort through 
uh, what the issues that they were having. So this is this was a pilot program, and it was uh, suspended, and and there was a soft restart. Um, it was suspended after a year. There was a soft restart halfway through COVID. That got uh, put back on hold for a few minutes or for a little while because of uh, requiring registration. And we are looking at at a way to have another soft restart. Um, the staff report is going to come back on this. And by all accounts, from what I've heard, it is, uh, and, and this is, I haven't seen the staff report, of course, but it is going to be, uh, by all accounts, the reviews have been favorable. And I would anticipate that it is going to continue. So at this point, I would like to make a motion to uh, move the $85,000 as an ongoing expense uh, into the parking lot for the multi-service youth center. Uh, and this is for a future commitment. Should the uh, staff report come back uh, favorably? All second. Councillor Austin. Oops. Seconded by, I don't know who. Um, I, th I think I've said everything that I need to say. The uh, It is a worthwhile investment. The youth in Sackville have benefited greatly from it. Uh, I would like to see the program continue and I would like to see, um, I'd like to see the funding continue for it. So would appreciate your consideration for that. Thank you. And over to the chair, Councillor Dago Gammon. So on the list, we have um, Councillor Mancini to speak to the motion. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand from the councillor, so what's the advantage of putting that on the list where we know there's a report coming back? So is there an advantage to do that? So why not just wait till the report comes back like the other two items? And so that, I'm just trying to get an understanding why there's an advantage of putting it on the list now. Thank you. Would you like me to respond to that or would you like uh, uh, Jane to respond to that? Well, I think you're, you're the one counselor asking to put it on. So I, would I, I am. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Uh, at this point, the money would be allocated as part of the budget. It would. It is an ongoing expense. It, it would come back year over year, and by incorporating it into the budget, it would be there uh, as a natural course of things for future years. It would not have to be found uh, in a reserve in a few months should the report come back uh, favorably, uh, or next year it should not have to be found again. It would just be again incorporated into the into the Parks and Rec budget. And Jane would be able to allocate uh, whatever changes are going to be made I, uh, at the end of the budget cycle to, to incorporate all of it. Um, okay. uh, go ahead, uh, Madam Chair, go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was mostly going to say the same thing. I mean, this is an operational thing. If we want to entertain it and we're reasonably confident we want to continue this program, um, I think we should be putting it into the budget um, just uh, as a matter of making sure that we're budgeting prudently. Um, the only ones on the list that I, when I look at our list that I'm kind of in the mode of like, well, we should, we should leave those off the, off the list for now um, where they're one time. And I think there are some bigger question marks on them would be the art gallery and the Neptune theater grant request. So uh, I think this one should be in the budget, especially where it's going to be potentially an operational thing. If council ends up deciding, well, for whatever reason, we get the report and we say, oh, wait, this thing, surprise, surprise, it was actually terrible and we don't want to fund it. Well, then it just becomes a budgetary savings at that point. Um, I, I don't anticipate that will be the case. Thank you. Are there any more speakers to the motion? So the motion is that the budget committee request a briefing note detaining the measures and implications for including 85,000 in an ongoing funding for costs associated with the multi-service youth center. Future commitment within the proposed 2021-22 parks and recreation budget to be considered in the parking lot as an operating over budget option. Motion by Councillor Russell, seconded by Councillor Blackburn. It's a question. Question. 
Mr. Yes, and I'm calling, I'm calling for the question. Question? Okay. Beginning with District 3, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In, fa in favor? 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion? 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Chair Russell. Hello, let's count there for a second. In favor. Deputy Merritt. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. In favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Mayor Savage. In favor. Motion is carried. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, I would like to resume the chair now. Uh, next on the list is Councillor Lovelace. And we are back on the main motion. Oh, thank you for a third time. Awesome. I uh, appreciate that, Mr. Chair. So Denise, I just have a really quick question about um, distances with functional parkland. And in, as noted in um, the report, we're looking at, um, you know, regional center, we're looking at urban settlement areas outside the regional settlement, uh, but um, I'm wondering about the rural and where that fits, because we're, you know, is that, are we urban settlement area outside the regional settle, uh, center, or is there, an, you know, is, is there a just sort of a, a differentiation uh, when we're talking about rural areas uh, where we, we don't have, uh, you know, uh, park, parks and structures and all that kind of thing. I'm just wondering if you can explain that um, a functional park. And, and, in that, and I will note, yes, that you are talking about government as well as private. Uh, so just if, you, if I could get clarification on that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I'll take a stab at it, Councillor. I may, I may ask only need to come, uh, add a bit to it. But you're absolutely right. So as we outlined in our business plan, we have good information on um, the more urban areas. But to your point, oats in the rural areas, oftentimes some of the parkland is owned by the province. There's some private in it. And the, the, the spacing of homes, the, the way the, the road network is configured, we do have to do a bit more work through that park standard work on what the appropriate spacing is for more rural areas of the municipality. Like I say, we've got some good data on uh, more densely populated areas, but as we noted in the, in the business plan, we still have some work that we wanna do to, to better inform how the, the spacing is determined for rural areas. And some of the, as, as, council, as council was talking about some of the MBN data that we had, gave us some good information, but it really highlighted us for us because we're a municipality that's rural, urban, suburban, the whole bit that, you know, you, you can't just layer on standards from an urban area out to in a rural area that you need to incorporate the actual configuration and layout of rural. So, so that is a piece of work that we're, we're undertaking now. It's all part of some of the work we're doing on the green network, park standards, that we will be coming back with more information on it. And so that built amenity, uh, you know, that would that built amenity include the actual bed of the trail as a built amenity? Well, or it's, it, yeah, it's it's more it's it's things that you can do in in a park, right? So it's it's other activities, or it may be you know some of our parks are are passive parks that that there's not necessarily the for leisure, they're not necessarily structured. So it's interpreting what that built amenity means for a, in, a, in certain areas. It's not always just playgrounds and play structures and sports fields, right? It's trails, it's, it's sitting areas, it's, it's, it's areas around waterways and whatnot. So it's, it's interpreting the right kind of amenities for depending on the different areas of the municipality you're in. 
I got gotcha. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, these budget discussions are such a wonderful learning opportunity. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, they really are. Thank you. And, and I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the CAO, the CFO, uh, all of the executive directors and, and everybody else who has uh, come to the table uh, and just put them together and put the schedule together. It has worked out really, really well for this council where we have near 50% new councillors. Um, and and it, it has been phenomenal, even though it is pushing the calendar further and further to the right. Uh, I, I think the trade-off has been worth it. There are no further speakers at this point. Uh, I was going to uh, speak about Neptune Theater, but I'm going to hold off on that. Um, so at this point, with no further speakers, uh, I would like, uh, I would appreciate it if the clerk could run Question. through the roll. The question has been called. Beginning with District 4, Councillor Purdy. Uh, in favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yupper dupper doo. <laughs> Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes for fun and games. 14, Councillor Blackburn. <laughs> Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Seamus does too. <laughs> in favor. Deputy Mayor Outhead. I'm voting yes, opens undecided. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Absolutely voting in favor. District two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Mayor Savage. In favor. It's fantastic. Thank you very much, colleagues. We now have a parks and rec budget. Um, the next item on the agenda is the adjournment. Thank you, uh, thank you Denise. So moved. Uh, so we stand adjourned. Our, our next virtual meeting is Halifax Regional Council on uh, Tuesday, April 6th and the Budget Committee on Wednesday, April 7th at 9.30 in the morning, where we will be talking about planning.